I think inflation is continuing to melt, which will allow the Fed to eventually ease. Inflation might not be as big of a problem if we get into a recession. I think the recession will do the job. If something bigger breaks and a crisis supersedes inflation for the short term, that could lead them to cut. The trouble will come in the second half when we then are actually facing much higher growth expectations. This is a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. What are we doing here? What are we doing here? You're a Lisa hey? Poodle short straw. <laughs> She's wearing the Easter Bunny outfit. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Counting you down to the payrolls report. 90 minutes away. Tom, that estimate was about 240. It's come oh, down to so. about 230 over the last couple of days after a series of data misses so far this week. No superlative, but this is one of those jobs report where things have changed dramatically in one day. Things have changed dramatically re across four or five days. It's a different jobs report than what we were thinking about on Monday, and it's all about what Ellen Zentner is going to talk about, which is a slowing American economy. I'd say it's all about the data we've had so far this week. If you look at the activity yeah. data, the ISMs, manufacturing services, downside surprises. If you look at the ADP report, downside surprise and claims yesterday, Tom, the wrong kind of upside surprise. Yeah. Jobless claims starting to leak just a little bit higher. Stephen Stanley, who Mike McKee adores, Stephen Stanley, uh, really, I thought was Santander, was really quite good about the nuances of claims where they made adjustments and it was worse, but he's unsure how worse it was. And as anybody in economics, he needs to see more data migrating up to 220. And dare I say some modeling out to 240. I believe Goldman Sachs was there uh, in my travels. I'd go back a year. Tom, I went through the data this morning. I had to go all the way back to the March report delivered in early April for the last time we had a downside surprise on a payrolls report. It's been upside surprise, well, upside surprise for the best part of 12 months. What we're going to do today, folks, in this special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with some wonderful guests to give you perspective, is sort of frame out not so much this jobs day, but the entirety of it for America, and flank, frankly, linking it into the worldwide view as well. With Dr. Alarian with us here later and with talking to the managing director yesterday, it'll be great to get a global GDP view on that. John, let me review that. That made headlines yesterday today before we get to the data, and it's just simple. I've never seen this in umpteen years of studying international economics. The IMF went from 3.8 percent is a five-year view, John, per year, down to 3 percent growth over five years, per year, over five years. And the answer is I've never seen that. So weakest growth profile since the 90s. Is that 20, right? Uh, 33 years. Wow. 33. Uh, wow. It's a wow statistic and uh, somewhat courageous given the way the IMF's get, getting beaten around. And right China now. and the reopening is not going to bail us out. We just go back to trend after yeah, a year of reopening. Yeah, I think that's reopening. been a shift in the last 30 days as we've gone from a whoop de doo 5%, 6% GDP to uh, we're not sure. We've got to compare and contrast the Come views on the Federal Reserve as well. Jim Bernard of the St. Louis Fed yesterday, seemingly suggesting, Tom, that perhaps we've seen the worst of it in the banking sector. Mm. He went on to say this, and I found this peculiar compared to what I've heard from other people. It's a good moment to continue the fight against inflation and try to get on that disinflationary path. On the same day we heard that from Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed, we heard this from Torsten Slock of Apollo, who we caught up with yesterday. Tom, he said quite simply, the credit crunch has started. And I said to Torsten yesterday, I said, Torsten, do you believe the last hike was the final hike of this hiking cycle? He said, yes. He thinks that's it. The Fed is yeah, done. The history of this, and we're not going to do fancy charts today. We're chart free today on Bloomberg Surveillance, is recessions come quickly. Slowdowns come quickly. They're not like a gradual slope. On a chart, folks, it goes straight down. And that's maybe where we are right now. Let's give you a snapshot of the markets. Equity futures are open. Equity futures not doing much. Positive, then negative by about a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Are they trading? Totally unchanged on the Nasdaq. Equity futures are trading, Tom. Cash bonds, treasuries, they open in about 56 minutes I time. I have comfort here. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Is Bitcoin's 24 oblivious. 7 all the time. 24 7 all the time. Doesn't and celebrate religious holidays. <laughs> it's a religious no days off. <laughs> It's a religious experience <laughs> in its own. Just under 28,000 on BitDog. Thanks for that. Your estimate today, if you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. The payrolls report comes out in about 90 minutes from now. We're looking for something in and around 230,000, according <clears> to our <throat> survey. Joining us now to discuss is Priya Misra, the head of global rate strategy at TD Securities. Priya, let's start there and welcome to the program. Just wonderful to do this with you. Priya, what are you and the team looking for in about an hour and 30 minutes? 
So we're looking for another strong report. 270,000 is, is, is our forecast, 0.3 on wages, participation slightly uh, ticking higher. So, you know, we're very concerned about the hard landing, but later this year, we don't think that this report is going to show it because all the high frequency data of small business hiring is still strong. So we're looking for another strong report. I'm not sure it matters a whole lot for the market. I think the market reaction will be highly asymmetric. If we're wrong and we get a slight miss, I think the market reacts a lot more uh, than essentially if we get a strong report. So Priya, basically what we're going to do is discount anything that says this economy is okay and embrace anything that says this economy isn't doing well. I think so. I think, uh, you know, partly the data that we're looking at is, is responding to monetary policy six months ago, and it's absolutely not responding to the banking crisis that just, uh, you know, well, that we're going through. So I would argue the data's lagged. The market's already kind of nervous about, are we at the end of the cycle? You know, when does the cycle turn? When does the Fed start to cut rates? Market's forward-looking. We're What we're getting is highly lagged data. So I think the market's going to be a lot more sensitive to any weakness right now is probably telling you that the, that the economy is already was already slowing going into the banking crisis. So I think that's why the market is going to react a lot more. We saw that this week. ISM mm -hmm. jewels, uh, you know, I think we saw significant reactions to these downside surprise. Now, we're lot, not looking for that downside surprise. But if we do get that, and we could get that in wages, wages is notoriously hard right. to, uh, and, and extremely volatile on a month over month basis. Remember last month, we got a slight miss on wages and the two year moved 30 basis points on that day. Uh, and, and then today's, uh, uh, today's also a uh, uh, sort of short day. So uh, we, we could get a, a, a pretty big reaction. Priya, I think Zero Hedge featured it. I'll give them credit. But they mentioned that Jerome Powell looks at the short-term space away from the twos tens. And he's looking maybe at a three-month T-bill and then the same guesstimate of a three-month T-bill 18 months from now. Explain to our audience what the chair, what the chairman's looking at there, looking at 90 day full faith and credit paper and then the guesstimate of the market out a year and a half. Sure. So I think what a lot of Fed officials, us included, we we look at, um, you know, is the market pricing in rate cuts in the very near term? Because that would be a sign that policy is restrictive. The market expects that the economic outlook is going to worsen and the Fed is going to have to cut rates. That signal has been inverted for a while, uh, meaning the market saying that front end rates are, are extremely high. The Fed's going to have to cut rates. You know, I think the market right now is pricing in the first 25 basis point cut by September. There was a time earlier this week that was being priced for June, July. So I would say that, you know, I, I disagree a little bit with how quickly these cuts are being priced in. But if you look at the total amount right. of cuts, we're not pricing in that much in cuts. The Fed funds rate at the end of next year is priced right. to be 275. That's not a recession in my mind. We get a recession. The Fed's getting a lot below 275. So to speculate... And to game the guess, what does TD Securities recommend? Are you buying 30-year zero-coupon bonds? Are you working in the short-term space? Where's this play, the place to guesstimate on the pre and misra uh, uh, bet? So we've been long tens. Um, you know, it's more of a risk reward view. In hindsight, over the last week, I should have been long twos rather than tens because that front end's moved a lot more. But if the data is okay, I think the market can actually push out the timing of the first cut. So it might be safer to be in five year or 10 year. You talk about 30 years zero coupon, that's a pretty high conviction view that we're heading into a recession right this second. So I would rather be a little bit in the curve, but being in the very front end, you know, it's a great trade right now. If you're buying five, percent bills, that's great. But what are you doing six months from now when the Fed starts to cut rates or a year from now when Fed funds is at 2%? So when I think about reinvestment risk, I think the very front end, it's a great short-term liquidity play, but it's not a play for over the next two years. I would say the five-year or the 10-year, we've been long tens. I would say being long fives is also attractive. You're not positioning for when the Fed starts to cut rates. You're positioning for, number one, a hedge to risk assets. Number two, that the Fed is going to cut a lot more than what is priced in whenever they start to cut. We we can debate that. Yeah. But I think they're going to cut much more because they'll want to be in accommodative territory. I'm thinking 1%, 2%, that's not 3%. We know 3% is high Fed funds. So I think they'll have to go much below that. Priya, that's against the consensus because some people think we stop at three. Here's the communication we've had so far from the Federal Reserve. Priya, Jim Bullard yesterday, I found some of this slightly confusing. He said the following, that continued appropriate macroprudential policy can contain financial stress. Then went on to say, while appropriate monetary policy can continue to put downward pressure on inflation. Isn't that contradicted by the fact that they've told us in the last month that financial stress is a substitute for rate hikes? 
I think it depends on where, how is that financial stress manifesting itself? You know, if it is tightening in financial conditions, if it is tightening in lending standards, I absolutely think that the, uh, that, that is a substitute for rate hikes. If it is just liquidity concerns and, and the banks need liquidity, I think at that point, the Fed can try and sort of disentangle, uh, you know, financial crisis management from monetary policy. I think right now we don't know, but our view is that uh, that this liquidity banking crisis is morphing into a capital crisis. It's not something we, I think we'll see right away, but banks tighten lending standards, bank net interest margins are going to be under pressure. They are going, you know, if bank lending slows down at precisely the same time as the consumer savings buffer goes down, that's what sort of supercharges yeah. the weakness. So at that point, I think the Fed will need monetary policy. I think trying to separate the two is actually dangerous, but I think the Fed will need to see actual data. The one big difference, I think we all have to get used to, the Fed reaction function is going to be a lot more reactive than preemptive because of inflation. So I think we're going to have to see it in the data and the jobs data in the consumer spending data for the Fed to say, okay, we need to use monetary policy. Um, I think right now we're not there. Um, so, you know, which is why I think that curve that I know you're going to ask me about, which has steepened, yep. I think it's hard for it to keep steepening until the Fed actually says, yes, we're about to use monetary policy. And I think today's data is not going to give them that. They're going to need to see the unemployment rate getting, you know, north of four percent, four and a half percent, and we have we're very far from that. For them to say, okay, we're sort of done, we're we're getting ready to ease. That's when that curve is going to steepen a lot. Priya, you teed up the next segment. So we'll pick up on the yield curve in just a moment. Priya Mishra there of TD Securities is going to stick with us. Tom, just some tension there between the market view at the moment, which is pricing a disinflationary bust perhaps in the bond market, and then the view of some Fed officials out there speaking at the moment. It's all coming at us and at the governors, the presidents, and the chairman, the vice chair. Is is in lightning speed in this is April, and I would dovetail it into, as Priya said, the capital issue moving from liquidity issue. Where do you see that? A single sentence from the managing director yesterday on commercial real estate. Why is the IMF talking about commercial real estate? Yeah. That's why. I keep capital. going back to the calendar. Payrolls <clears throat> in about one hour and 20 minutes. Then on to April 12th, CPI. Back end of next week, right. some bank earnings. Priya Mishra is going to stick with us from TD. That's up next. And a little John. bit later, Tom, 8 o'clock, we'll catch up with Mohammed oh. Al Arian around this table. A little bit later, Tiger Woods tees up at 12.54 p.m. There you go, round two. You need to know about Victor Hovland, okay? I know, he's doing yeah, well. He's doing he's better than well. well. Absolutely killing Tiger it. Playing alongside well. Tiger, who's not playing yeah. so well. But double, but come on, birdies on the 15 and 16. This is Tiger's Day. Are we doing Masters coverage today? <laughs> not with me or not. <laughs> that would be a future. Could you down see the two of us at the about Masters? About a tenth of one percent. We should make that happen next year. We should, so it's very relaxing. We could do the jobs report with a little You'd have to be binocular quiet. thingy. Could, could you manage that? You'd have yeah, to be quiet. I'd have to put can a cork. Can you, can you manage that? The Masters that? <laughs> cork, it's green in my mouth. Can't get that picture out of my head. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says China wants to have it both ways when it comes to the war in Ukraine. In an interview with the European news network Euronews, Blinken said China is trying to advance a ceasefire proposal while also backing Russian President Vladimir Putin. He added China should be focused on urging Russia to respect Ukraine's sovereignty and to give back to the territory it has seized by force. Israel strikes back after the most sustained barrage of rockets launched from Lebanon and Gaza in 17 years. Israeli jets bombed Hamas sites in the Gaza Strip early Friday, causing property damage but no injuries, according to Hamas officials. Israel targeted underground tunnels and sites used for weapons production. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I think the inflation might not be as big of a problem if we get into a recession. I think the recession will do the job. Now, that was not the plan of the Fed. It was a soft landing, not crashing the banking sector. But that's the part that they should have seen. I think there was a regulatory failure, and uh, the, the Fed needs to own it and change. Luigi Zingales, the professor of finance at the University of Chicago, just absolutely fantastic yesterday. 
Tommy had this to say. In the last two years, the Fed has failed twice. It has failed to see inflation coming. It has failed to see the banking crisis coming. Really brutal stuff. It is. You're going to, a nation needs a trustworthy Fed to combat inflation, and on we go. And this is the trust question that's out there with Dr. Larry and helping later. Singalis wrote a book that I featured a couple years ago now. Actually, John. 11 years ago, a capitalism for the people, and that's what Professor Zingales is screaming about, is, is this idea that they got to get capitalism and, frankly, a Fed policy around it's more nimble for the people. And the storm clouds of the last five or six days is really the first, I, I would call it, direct emotion that Jerome Powell has to face of slowdown. It's I new. imagine Mohammed's going to have some things to say about <clears throat> this. Mohammed El is joining us a little bit later this morning in about 43 minutes time. About 40 minutes' time. Yeah. Looking forward to that conversation. About an hour from now, an hour and 12 minutes, we'll have the payrolls report. The estimate at the start of the week was something close to 240. Just had a series of data misses so far this week. That estimate has come down just a little bit, Tom, to about 230. Well, it's come down to 230, and it's far more, is, is, is I think, as is, is we heard from Priya Misra, and, and she joins us here in a moment, is a wage dynamic. And it's going to be the dovetail of this. And what it does really, John, is add to each and every data point you see. And I'm going to go back to the 60 thousand foot view from the IMF of global slowdown. And now, as you mentioned, every tea leaf this week is, in, is, is indicated an American slowdown. Is Atlanta GDP now is solidly under 3%. Priya Misra, still with us of TD Securities. Priya, let's start there with the bond market, with the yield curve. You made a wonderful call in the last 12 months. You were talking up negative 50, negative 60. We got to negative 110, Priya, only a number of weeks ago. What's the call on the curve now? So I have to say I'm somewhat neutral here on the curve. I prefer duration risk over curve risk because here's the problem. The slowdown that we're seeing in the economy, that is an intended consequence of, of rate hikes. But slowdowns never happen gradually. If we're heading into a recession, there's going to be a really sharp uh, deceleration. The Fed's going to have to respond. The curve will likely then steepen. And, you know, the curve typically moves 100, 200 basis points. So, you know, we've steepened a little bit. I would say into today, we can actually expect a little bit of flattening because, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're still looking for a strong report. But if the economy is indeed turning, if the bank crisis, uh, which in our view is already morphed into a capital crisis, if that's resulting in a decline in lending standards, the curve can steepen. Instead of trading the curve, I'm actually long duration. Um, I think fives and tens are, are a better place to park your money than trading the curve because I think it's going to be asymmetric. You know, rates can fall a lot more. How much more do they rise? I think the curve is a lot more symmetric, meaning it can flatten back to the lows if the economy is okay and we can sort of go back to where we were earlier in the year or it can steepen 100 basis points if the Fed is about to start to cut rates. So I think it's a very, very tricky on the curve. I would not really uh, you know, uh, put a lot of chips on, on, on the curve here. Priya, your view on the Federal Reserve is all about the seat that you sit in. For the markets, they're going to be proactive and price in a lot of this up front. You said something about the Fed being increasingly reactive. So for the market, there's this belief now this economy is just going to turn over. Ignore the good data, focus on the bad stuff. For the Fed, it feels like it's going to be the other way around. So, Priya, that really raises the question for me, just how much wider that spread between market pricing and Fed projections can actually get in the coming months. Sure, that's a great point. I think the market is used to a very preemptive Fed. Remember the Fed during COVID, remember 2008. I think we really have to go back to the 80s when the Fed was torn between its two uh, mandates. And I think we're going to face that later this year because inflation is extremely sticky. You know, uh, wages are still high. So it's hard to see how that core services X shelter is going to come down significantly. As the unemployment rate rises, I think the Fed's going to be torn. And then we think they're going to be extremely reactive. Now, your point about market pricing, I think the market pricing in the very front end will have to respond to what the Fed does. Mm -hmm. If they continue to come out that they're not going to cut rates, I think that the front end, zero, uh, you know, one year, two year rates will have to correct. I actually think that market pricing will increase in the long end because the more uh, reactive the Fed is, the more they'll have to cut. And the market's not pricing in that many cuts. We're pricing in cuts, 200 basis points of cuts. Right. If the Fed starts to cut late, I suspect they're cutting a lot more because at that point, we're not just talking about a shallow recession. We're talking about a deep recession. And then the Fed will have to cut down to 1%, 2%, dare I say zero. I would suggest that we're not paying attention to the real yield. It's collared here from a 1.65, 1.70 down to 1%. We've come in very tightly on the inflation-adjusted yield to 1.04%. Priya, what is the signal? 
are the ramifications if the real yield, the 10-year real yield, falls under 1.00%? I think that's telling you that the market really expects that, that things are going to slow down. I would say, you know, 1% is a good level, but I think really a recession level would be more consistent with zero or negative. So, in fact, this tells me where real rates are, tells me that the market, no market is placing in a really hard landing, um, you know, scenario. As, uh, you know, if the market starts to get more convinced that we're heading into a hard landing, into a recession, that the unemployment rate is rising much more than the Fed forecasted it to, I think those real rates are going to go closer to zero. Because remember, how does the Fed stimulate uh, the economy is by taking those real rates into, you know, very close to zero negative territory, which is where we've been at in previous recessions. So I think there's a lot of room for those real rates to come down. But again, do you own front-end real rates or long-end? I would say right now, uh, given that the economy is not very clearly heading into a recession right this second, it's better to own right. a little bit further out the curve. Let's expand that. I don't want you to play economist here. I want you to play you know, your expertise in yield. But you say you don't see a recession coming. How do you dovetail that with what a team of PhDs at the IMF suggests or the economic data of the recent days? So the economic data is weakening for sure, but you know we were running at a very red hot economic uh, growth pace all of 2022 early this year. So things are going to slow down. I think it's the trajectory of the slowdown. It's just started to slow down. And what worries me is when we head into a recession, it's a very non-linear weakening in the economy, mm -hmm. very hard to forecast. Does that happen right now? Does that happen later this year? In our view, it happens later this year, that things slow down. And then when the savings buffer runs out and, and the banks start to tend, uh, tighten lending standards more, that's when it sort of heads into recession territory. Absolutely, the economy is slowing. But is it a recession today? We think not. And I think we don't know, and nor does the Fed. So we're all going to be looking at data. The market's going to run ahead with this narrative of a recession. And if the Fed says not so fast, I think that's when some markets, I would argue risk assets, are not pricing in a hard landing at all. I, th I see, I'm, I'm more nervous about where risk assets are yep. rather than rates, because I think there's some weakening there that the Fed's not responding. If rates are low because the economy is slowing, that's not good news for, uh, for risk assets. Pretty well said. Great to get your thoughts, as always. Premier Minister there of TD Securities. Tom, what's more important to you? The Fed making a move or the why of it? The why? The why the of it Fed to me is, is critical the because the Fed's going to make a move based on data. They're going to be ex post, ex post, ex post. There's this entire gauze out there, this fog, if you will, that they're going to somehow be out front of this. It's grossly unfair to entry to any central bank is as well. They're going to wait for the data. And as Priya says, when it goes, it goes yeah. fast. Not all and rate it's not cuts, about Tom. a Fed meeting. Not all rate cuts are created equally. We've talked about this a million times. If you get that immaculate disinflation, Fantastic. That's bullish, without a doubt. If they can reduce rates because of that, mm. that's not what we're talking about here. Yeah. We're talking about a disinflationary bust off the back of a banking shock. And what Priya alluded to there is really trying to get a better understanding of the long and variable lags of a banking shock, never mind uh, rate uh, hikes. Uh, a study of long and variable lags here is very much warranted, but this is a Fed that's going to wait for the data. And I'm sort of looking out to the late July meeting as being far more important. We've got to get there. In Neil Dutt over Renaissance Macro writes in. He says this, I'd take the other side. There's more risk Why in bonds. Why did I know that? There's more risk in bonds. Oh, I thought he was talking about Tiger Woods. No. Oh, no. Excuse You're me. focused on the Masters, aren't you? I find Augusta National so relaxing. Yes, exactly. It's like therapy. I've said that a few times. Make a coffee, stay in bed. It's going to be a bit of a snooze until about 8.30 Eastern time. Bitcoin's After that, trading. get some fireworks. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500. Negative, not even a tenth of 1%. Equity futures still trading. Of course, cash equities closed today for Good Friday. Cash bonds, treasuries opening up in about 30 minutes time, Tom. Going into that open, 382 is where the two-year closed just yesterday. Yields down the 10-year was testing earlier today a, a shockingly low level. I mean, we're back to Steve Major territory. Let's let's just say that back we've, in had, the threes. we've had a shift here. You mentioned Steve Major. Bob Michael of J.P. Morgan Asset Management thinks the whole curve, twos out to 30s, 3.0%. That's stunning. In the and, next few and months. And that goes to what we were talking to Priya Misra about is how this 10-year real yield, which I don't think gets talked about enough, is coming down, showing 
that not malaise, but just that economic reset we're talking about. Just to return back to the calendar, we've talked about this a lot at about 8.30, so 60 minutes from now, we'll get the payrolls report in America on to April 12th, the CPI report. Then for those of you interested in the bank earnings, and I know many of you are, First Republic, a name we've talked a lot about, Tom, in the last yeah, couple of weeks, sure. they report, or at least scheduled to report on the 13th. On the 14th, you'll hear from JP Morgan, so lots of bank yeah. earnings coming next week too. The estimate today, 230,000. Alan Zetner of Morgan Stanley calling for something around 240k and saying the following we expect net new job creation to decelerate tom from the february pace as labor market indicators have started to show signs of easing and the effects of seasonal factors normalize it's an important conversation right now as ellen zentner on the high ground on analysis of the american consumer folding that into our economic growth over the uh, years, the tours of duty she's had, she now uh, holds court at Morgan Stanley as her chief U.S. economist. Let me go back to a question I'd asked you 10 years ago. How's the American consumer fit into the supposed economic slowdown we're living right now? Well, I think a lot of it has to be driven by the consumer. Uh, you know, 70 percent of the economy, it's going to dictate uh, GDP. So we front-loaded a lot of economic activity into uh, January and February right, because right, of the right. warm weather. Um, we've had a large stimulus program uh, end in March. You take a hit on government transfers to households. Um, you do have uh, slowing job gains. So you've got negative disposable income going into the second quarter, and consumer spending and GDP are going to be negative in the second quarter. So I think even though we're not calling for recession this year, coming in with negative GDP, right, it's going to keep those recession fears alive. Do you model a negative non-farm payrolls statistic as David Kelly talks about at J.P. Morgan? So we have uh, payroll slowing down pretty sharply in the months ahead. By the middle of the year, we're down to 40,000. Now, 200,000 is one standard deviation. If you cut out the COVID period, that standard deviation blew it out to about 1 million. Sure. Um, but before COVID, standard deviation was about 200,000. So at 40,000, it could be well negative or it could still be quite quite strong. Um, but we've been expecting this really marked step down in job gains that just never seemed to come. Every month we were getting a big report. We'd push out our expectation by a month of that <laughs> slowdown. And we were very close to coming back to the table and saying, when do we admit we're just wrong? We're just not going to get the slowdown. This is the first time that this payroll report, because I do think there are downside risks here. I think the market is looking for a one handle on this number. Uh, and it's the first time that it feels like this could be the start of that more uh, notable slowdown in, in job gains. And that's what we really need, right? We've got to take pressure off the labor market, off wages. We've got to have more slack in the economy. That language at the end there, that's what we really need. Yeah. That's what we've been talking about for a year. Jolts, job openings. For a long time, everyone said that's the target, that's the objective, get it lower. Then it happened this week, and all yeah. of a sudden that's bad. Has the story changed? Well, I think be careful what you wish for. Um, look, the, the, the drop in job openings, jolts, we saw it in August and we thought this is the beginning and then it flattened out and kind of increased again. Now we've got a big drop again. You know, the um, uh, chief economist um, that I hobnob with, right, in that environment, at Indeed, at LinkedIn, they've been putting out these reports for some time showing that job openings have been dropping. Um, indeed, even calling them phantom openings. Um, and it just hadn't been showing up in the official data. Now that it shows up in the official data, the question is uh, always, oh my gosh, wait, now we're going to have a big slowdown in jobs. Does that mean negative? And so, because right now you could imagine a market on pins and needles, investors that are very, nerves are still stretched thin after the bank funding pressures emerged. And so you're looking for the negative side of things. Have we gone too far? Are we just going to run off the cliff here with jobs? And maybe in a month or two, we're all ready to negative job gains. So we've had a year of upside surprises on payrolls. Tom and I were talking about the data. I was going back through it this morning, Alan. I think it was literally the March report in April was the last time we had a downside surprise yeah. on a payrolls report. Yeah. The reason people believe we could have a downside surprise this week is because we've had a series of downside surprises so far this week. What can you read into what we saw in the ISM manufacturing and the ISM services read we got earlier on? Yeah, so the ISM um, is a diffusion index, so it's not quantity measure. Um, and so all we can glean from the employment indices there is that, look, uh, uh, the labor market in those sectors was weaker than the prior month. 
And so we are forecasting weaker services, jobs um, than the prior month, for instance. And so that is in line, but the ISM diffusion index doesn't necessarily tell you exactly what the quantity of jobs is. It just tells you that you're probably right that we created less, say, service sector jobs than the prior month. But you had upward revisions in initial jobless claims. So before the upward revisions yesterday, we had jobless claims that were about flat with the survey week in the prior month. Now they're up about 30K compared with the same time in the prior month. So again, like you said, it's been a string of downside surprises, which has set the tone for the right. report today. How do you write your weekend note into Monday off of what the IMF said yesterday? I was thunderstruck at a five-year, 3%-ish or even lower global growth. To me, in my, my textbooks, that's a global recession. Does Morgan Stanley model something so grim? So, you know, there are, there are quite a few. Um, so grim, yes. Um, we're um, above 2.5%, which is sort of the, the threshold, at least, that, say, OECD puts out that says global that's a global GDP recession. Global GDP above 2.5%. Uh, yeah. So we have global GDP above 2.5%, um, not yeah. much better than, than the IMF. This um, is a new era. But look at, you know, in the U.S., Tom, we're forecasting 0.3% GDP on a Q4 of a Q4 basis. We have a negative quarter in the second so quarter. So what does that do non-farm payrolls? Quarter. Give me a three-month, six-month non-farm payrolls moving average off of your 0.x statistic GDP. Well, so if you're looking at a three-month moving average by the middle of the year, so we get out of these very early in the year, very mm -hmm. big reads, then you're talking about less than um, break-even on payrolls, 90,000. So you should start seeing the unemployment rate this moving is, John, more quickly this, then. Th let me make this clear, folks. From yesterday morning in the speech of the managing director, this is a massive global and domestic reset. This is not a normal Good Friday jobs report. Oh, not at all. To Alan's point, there's a real belief that maybe this is the month after saying that for about a year. Perhaps this is the month where we see that weakness. When we get to May 3rd, or rather when the Federal Reserve gets to May 3rd, do you think they're going to have sufficient information about the banking shock to make a decision one way or the other? And if they're unsure, is the bias to hike or is the bias to wait? I think if they're unsure and they're uncertain, then I think financial stability will win out. I don't think that this close to wherever neutral may be, that you're going to quibble over 25 basis points. And I think you can double down on your message that we've got rates into sufficiently restrictive territory, and so we are going to hold them there for some time because we're still vigilant in our battle against inflation. That's still the market disconnect, is the market expecting several cuts before the end of the year, yep. and the Fed's still saying we're not going to cut till 2024. It's just, it, it's going to be that tug of war. Maybe we have one more battle between that of the don't fight the Fed. Um, and then the data is either going to prove that the Fed's going to need to reduce rates before the end of the year or not. But I think we're still a little ways off from them determining that. Along with variable lags, we've asked this question a few times over the last week. What are the lags of a banking shock in the nature of the banking shock that we've had over the last month? Yeah. So, um, Look, the, you can see in the weekly data that we are back at a period of relative stability, but you can also see that obviously liquidity was needed and is still needed uh, for parts of the banking sector. But you've stabilized that, but you're still going to have slower loan growth. So to give some context, loan growth was about 10 percent in the first quarter, really strong loan growth. If it slows to around 2 percent by the end of the year, which I think is a, is a, is a, a good assumption, um, then it took down our growth forecast another tenth this year. So we were at 0.4, now we're at 0.3 mm -hmm. for this year. Now, you may think, wow, that's not that big of a change. The bigger change is in 2024. Because I think what surprises people is how long these credit shocks take to move through the economy. This is not a credit crunch. I know it's a really nice term to use. We've not cut off the flow of credit to the economy yet. Talk That's a credit crunch. Talk to the stock of Apollo said it is but a credit, a credit crunch. That impulse moves through the economy. You can start to really see it in the third quarter. The, the largest cumulative impacts come in the fourth quarter of this year and first quarter right. of next year. So it takes 2024 growth down more so than this year. But you're just putting a lot of weight on a year right. when we're barely above water. Iconic. And when I used to go to China umpteen times a year, was you'd get off the plane in Hong Kong and you go down the corridor and there was a Steve Roach, Morgan Stanley billboard of Morgan Stanley greeting you to Asia, Morgan Stanley greeting you to Hong Kong. Can you run that billboard now? Can you tell Mr. Gorman he can run that billboard effectively? Or is, is the U.S. so disparate from China, Morgan Stanley can't make that gap for business? No, I think that, look, we're going through global shifts. 
Um, and we've had this uh, conversation, this narrative with, with China, um, looking at how we can massage our trade with China, how we can make it more fair. I think it became, uh, you know, more difficult when it played out on the public stage in the last six, eight years. Um, but these conversations and these shifts are ongoing. We've, our strategists have put out great research calling this the multipolar world. Um, and it means that you can still do very strong business in China, but from a manufacturing standpoint, those trade ties do need to shift. And then this was wonderful. Thanks Just for being with us so in person good. and in center there of Morgan Stanley. Tom, what a year so far. It's only April. <laughs> yeah, we had soft exhausting. landing, no landing, hard yeah. landing, tons of cuts in between. And what's so it's important nuts. here in the reset is this market, I mean equities, particularly equities, but equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, are we modeling in a sub-100,000 run rate on non-farm payrolls? I would respectfully suggest we aren't. I'd suggest this bond market is anticipating some real weakness. And to Priya Misra's point over at TD, no real signs of that at the index level on the S&P 500, Tom. Still stuck in that range, 38 to 4,200. Oh, it's stunning. Yeah, there's been some really nice charts of this off the Bloomberg comparing equities SPX versus whatever bond flavor you want, and it's two different worlds right now. For once, some muted price action. Equity futures really not doing much going into the print at 8.30 Eastern time. About 50 minutes from now, we'll have the payrolls report at 8.15. So in about 30 minutes, we'll catch up with Randy Crozen at the former Fed governor. Looking forward to that conversation. Before that, Mohamed al Arian joining us for the hour in about 20 minutes. Looking forward to that as well. Equity futures essentially unchanged. Your payrolls report just around the corner. The estimate, 230,000. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Russia may quit the Ukraine grain deal if obstacles in the way of Russian grain and fertilizer exports aren't resolved within 60 days. And that's according to Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, who spoke in Turkey today. Despite Lavrov's comment, Russia is forecast to be the world's largest wheat exporter in the 2022-23 season, and its export prices have become the de facto global benchmark. Taiwan officials say they still expect a visit from U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. McCarthy met Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen earlier this week in Los Angeles, stressing the importance of the relationship between the two sides, economic freedom, peace and stability in the region. The location was apparently chosen to avoid a repeat of tension seen in August when Nancy Pelosi became the first sitting House Speaker in 25 years to visit Taiwan. It may not feel like it but when you're grocery shopping, but global food costs are falling. A United Nations index of food costs slid for a 12th straight month to its lowest level since July 2021. Still, the gauge is up almost 40 percent from two years ago. And officials say there's little indication that the decline is actually feeding through to store shelves. And Samsung is cutting its memory chip production after reporting its slimmest profits since the 2009 financial crisis. Operating profit missed estimates falling more than 95 percent to $450 million for the three months ended March. Sales dropped 19 percent. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I'm afraid about the market because if you have a credit slowdown and you have an economic slowdown that follows from it, you're going to have an earnings slowdown. You're going to have a revenue slowdown, uh, effectively a, a, an operating slowdown in, in the corporate world. That was Terry Wiseman, the global interest rates and currency strategist over at Macquarie, weighing in on this slowdown. Is it really a credit crunch? Torsten's Apollo Slock says it is. And Zetra Morgan Stanley says that's not what we've got in front of us right now. And that's the debate at the moment going into payrolls. The number <coughs> for payrolls drops in about 44 minutes. 8.30 Eastern time. Counting down to that data at 8.30, Anna Wong of Bloomberg Economics expecting a number of 230,000 to be the number we see a little bit later this morning. She says this, the payrolls print, as well as jobless claims and jolts data released earlier in the week, likely will convince policymakers that rates are close to a sufficiently restrictive level. Bloomberg Economics' Tom expects the Fed will hike by another 25 basis points to 5.25 at the May meeting, then hold rates there 
for the rest of the There's year. There's a key phrase for the rest Hold. of the year. Yep. Hold, not cut. This is so important. Anna Wong with really courageous leadership, it seems, years ago in saying reset to a higher belief in the interest rates. And uh, Anna Wong joins us now, chief U.S. economist for Bloomberg Economics. That's sort of where I am, Anna, is lift, then pause, pause, pause. What is the effect on our viewers and listeners of pause, 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 or even four pauses into the end of the year? Well, I, I think that, um, so we looked at the transmission of monetary policy to financial conditions, and the left is now significantly shorter than uh, what traditional models would tell you. I think once the Fed paused, um, immediately the, the financial markets would be uh, rallying, and our model sees financial <laughs> conditions uh, loosening to a degree where the cumulative right. effect of monetary policy would shift back to basically neutral by the time of mid-year this year. Uh, and I've got to go to your academic work at Chicago. I was thunderstruck yesterday at a 3% global growth statistic from the managing director of the IMF. You had the honor of studying with Raghun Rajan at Chicago. What does a 3% global growth statistic mean for America? Well, you know, I, so the transmission from global economies um, to the U.S. economy actually primarily operates not through the trade channel. U.S. has a very small export um, manufacturing base, so it's not like we are going to ex uh, benefit from this. And also in terms of uh, oil's impact, so when global growth is strong or weak, um, it tra um, um, if it's strong, then yeah. uh, U.S. export would have a, a terms of trade, positive terms of trade shock. But I don't think uh, that's what we're seeing. I, I think the I think the shock facing the global economy primarily stems from the, what the Federal Reserve would do. And if the Fed does pause mid-year, um, then I think it will be overall that effect, the stimulative effect, would be even um, stronger than whatever um, spillover is coming from abroad. John, this is the dynamics, and I don't know how to get to the gloom of the managing director over to this jobs report, because I'm hearing from Dr. Wong there that the global GDP ballet is actually separate from the American labor economy. We're going to learn about that in the coming months. Well, the nature months. of the financial shock in the United States is so different to what others have experienced. Yeah. In Europe, it's certainly not the same. We can point to Credit Suisse. Then that's the major difference right here in the U.S. right now. And when you talked about financial conditions, I believe you mentioned equities and risk assets would rally. I just wonder, should we care about that? What matters more, financial conditions that track things like stocks or tracking lending standards in the yeah. senior loan officer opinion survey that we'll get in the next month or so? Yes. So, so um, in the Chicago Financial uh, Conditions Index, which is, I think, our preferred index, they, they separate into risk assets versus credit channels. And uh, the lending survey a result actually shows that credit has been tightening long before the collapse of SVP. And uh, that channel of monetary policy transmission takes somewhat longer than risk assets. So risk assets will rally immediately when the Fed pauses, but the credit channel will continue to see some tightening even after the Fed pauses. So I think um, in terms of the um, effects on of Fed policies on the real economy, the credit channel in, indeed has a tighter linkage. And what you just said is so, so important. That predates, that trend predates the banking stress of the last month or so. So, Anna, with that in mind, when would you expect the banking stress to go through the credit channel and arrive in the economic data on our screens? Payrolls, CPI, all yeah. of the above. How long does that take? So, I think that um, uh, our model shows that the transmission effect of credit channel takes about just maybe three to six months. <clears throat> and um, in terms of the uh, um, uh, whether the credit channel is tightening, we sh uh, the variables we look at is spreads of corporate uh, borrowing rates um, from Treasury yields and also VIX. And all that seems to, to us, suggest to us that this banking shock is just transitory. So we estimate that it only um, subtracts about substitute for about 25 to 50 basis point of rate hikes for this year. So um, I, I think the slowdown this year primarily is due to the cumulative effect of Fed tightening rather than um, the marginal effect of the banking crisis. And I just want to pick up on something you said. You think the banking shock will be transitory. Can you tell me precisely what you mean by that? Are you suggesting that any tightening in lending standards 
that's what's transitory or the hit to data is transitory? What do you, what do you mean exactly? Yeah, what, what I mean is, you know, imagine a, a week or two ago when the, the credit spreads uh, were ri- widening by, like, I think uh, uh, at one point, um, over 80 basis points. And that, that hit is very substantial. That would be very substantial to the real economy were that spread to uh, continue to widen at that level. I mean, uh, back in the GFC, credit spreads widen over 150 bits and stay widened for over a quarter. And that is that is the effect of like a very strong adverse uh, shock to the economy. But we already already see the spreads uh, widening, coming back down closer to the levels before uh, the collapse of SVP. That's what I meant, meant by transitory, to have a real durable impact on the economy in terms of how it translates mm. to, you know, economic models. Uh, you really have to have that CDS spreads widening by uh, for a, 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 and stay high for a long right. time. And a model for me, just something like Anna Wong 101, at what unemployment rate does Chairman Powell and the Fed, do they change their dialogue? We're going to get an unemployment rate today. John knows what the survey is. I never, I don't never look at the data. But is it like a 4% OMG, the world changes? Do you have in your head an unemployment rate that is critical for the chairman of the Fed? Yeah, so the Fed forecast that unemployment rate would reach 4.5% by the end of this year. So anything higher than that, so if suppose that the economy reached 4.5% mid-year rather than end of the year, that would be that would change the Fed's calculus, right? And if that's the case, then yeah. then I would see the possibility of cuts in the second half of this year. But I think right now the unemployment rate is on track to be undershooting 4.5% rather than overshooting. So uh, maybe maybe everything will change in an hour. But uh, <laughs> um, as of go. now, I think the tendency <laughs> is for uh, people to have to downwardly revise the unemployment rate for the uh, for the end year. Wow, interesting. Anna, this was a clinic, truly. Thank you. you know, she showed up. Anna, Anna you showed economics. up completely not media savvy. And now she's getting the whole idea of teasing. Everything might change in the next hour. to the next hour. Isn't it Analog true, though? market pro. <laughs> Isn't the, the whole narrative changes at about 8.30 Eastern time? It often does. <clears throat> It, it does, and, and we're at a point where we're going, like you mentioned, the length of the year so far, and we're really going, folks, day to day with banking, with banking crisis and all that, where every day there's a surprise where I go, wait, have I seen this before? And what's going to be today's surprise? I don't know. I will say this, though, Tom. I'm not sure it matters how strong that data point would be at 830. I don't think it would change the story for a lot of people. If it's super strong today, I think people would be willing to ignore it. If it's super weak, I think yeah. it would confirm the priors. And the bias right now is to believe that we're going to have a serious hit to growth off the back of the banking shock. Yes. And the 12 months of tightening we've had from the Federal Reserve. I just wonder <clears> how <throat> much strong data you need for how long I, to change that story. The Ellen Zentner picture here of 40,000, you know, under 100,000, 70,000, 40,000. Nobody, I don't think anybody has that into their market call, including in the equity market. What's the biggest struggle here in a Good Friday jobs report? We're, we're having Sanka. Did, when you grew up in England, did you Sanka. know what Sanka was? Are you suggesting in an Italian household? Exactly. We would, I, I can't we would imagine. Have Sanka. It. I mean, Marmite's bad enough, but Marmite's like gourmet compared you to could, Sanka. You could smell the freshly roasted coffee beans in, in my kitchen as a child, Tom. I can't imagine. I, you I know? mean, like, wicked jealous. I mean, it's great. Real deal. It's like you and me at Lake Como at that fancy no, we hotel. Missed, we missed that. You do, you know, know. do you know who made it down there? Mohammed did. Was he there? He was there. He's everywhere. He's going to be with us shortly. Mohammed al Arian of Bloomberg Opinion and Queen's College, Cambridge, here in New York City. Up next, counting it down to the payrolls report, 34 minutes away. The estimate in the Bloomberg survey, 230,000. The data just around the corner. I think inflation is continuing to melt, which will allow the Fed to eventually ease. Inflation might not be as big of a problem if we get into a recession. I think the recession will do the job. If something bigger breaks and a crisis supersedes inflation for the short term, that could lead them to cut. The trouble will come in the second half when we then are actually facing much higher growth expectations. This is a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. 
The payrolls report 30 minutes away, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and on radio alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow, joined together by Mohammed Al Arian in the studio here in New York City. Going into this jobs report, futures take a little bit of a leg lower. I wouldn't read too much into this. We're down about two tenths of 1% on the S&P. The estimate, if you're not familiar with it just yet, 230,000 is the median estimate in the Bloomberg survey. TK, we've had upside surprise after upside surprise for the best part of 12 months with the jobs report. Does that change today? Is this the day that it tips? And I, I'd also link it in, John, with the study of the domestic economy here, with the international economy, as we had Kristalina Gorgiev yesterday to have Dr. El Arian today, the kickoff to what we're going to see next week and how America in this jobs report folds into a pretty grim IMF global growth. The rules of combat for the next 60 minutes, this conversation, Tom, you cannot mention QPR. OK, we on the same page. You can't I've been talk briefed about on Queen's this. Park Rangers. I've, I've been, yeah, with, well, OK. Well, 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 Mohammed travels with an entourage of like, I think it's seven people and maybe he's pared it down because he's now with a, a university. He's down to five people. And one of them whispered in my ear, just whatever you do, don't say Otherwise, Preston, don't say Preston, don't say QPR. Go into the door. Yeah. Mohammed, so, we won't talk about your beloved football club. OK, we promise. I just wonder what happened to the other six people I travel with. I haven't seen them in my whole life. <laughs> well, they're there. You know, they're there. like my interns over, over here. I have a key question. How would the Fed be different with a pitch clock? I mean, in baseball, you know, the pitch clock's that would working be better. from what I see. But do we need at the press conference a clock going? No, I mean, I think they, they, they control the clock really well. That's not what they need. They need other things, but not a pitch clock. Well, let's talk about what they'll get in about 28 minutes. 230,000 is the estimate. Mohammed. we've had a series of misses so far this week. Can you read something into that for this? Well, certainly the market has. Not only has it revised the consensus forecast, but the rumor number is below the 230. And that is consistent with everything else we've seen. I find it fascinating because we have question marks not only about the jobs report, but it comes at a time when it's a 50-50 situation as to what does the Fed do next. So this report is going to be much more consequential in a way than others have been. This is a risk management job for the Fed. You've questioned their ability to do that appropriately. The decision they've got to make on May 3rd is a difficult one, as you've pointed out. Do you think the bias is to hike or is the bias to pause? Because the bias of this market is very, very different. Quite clearly, this market will discount anything that shows resilience in the economy and embrace anything that shows weakness. On May 3rd, when this Fed sits around that table, given the limited information they have, is the bias to hike or hold? So let's assume we don't know what the number says on May 3rd. I think the bias right now is to hike. You've heard that consistently. Um, there's two reasons for that. One is credibility. And two is they are really worried about repeating the 70s mistake. Um, they are dealing with a trilemma. Financial instability is an issue they have to worry about. But the good news, John, and I think this is important, is the financial contagion risk is much lower today. Unfortunately, we're dealing with the economic contagion risk. Jim Bullard yesterday said you can deal with the two separately. I found it somewhat confusing because at the same time they're telling us that one is a substitute for the other. Can you make sense of that? I can. I mean, he, he's rightly referring to the separation principle, which is you use monetary policy, interest rate policy for inflation. You use other tools, which they have a lot of, as we've seen, for financial stability. Now, there are clearly interactions, but I think it is correct to start with the presumption of separation of policy tools. Otherwise, if you use one policy tool for multiple objectives, you'll end up in the muddled middle. The overlay here is critical, and you have tangible experience on this as deputy director IMF back in the early 1990s. Kristalina Gorgieva dropped a bombshell yesterday of a five-year 3% growth model for the IMF. How does that affect America? To have that grimness, which we haven't seen since the early 90s, to have that grimness, how does that affect the people watching and listening? So let's add two more data points. Last week, the World Bank came out with a study that showed that potential growth was coming down. So it's not just actual growth, it's potential growth. Mm -hmm. Our ability to grow is coming down. That is also bad news. Let's also add the other bit of data, which is that certainly for this year, as the managing director said, China and India account for half the global growth. Right. So there's massive dispersion within a number that itself is too low. How does that affect the U.S.? In multiple ways. Um, the U.S. 
needs the global economy to grow, not as many as, as much as other countries, but still needs it. Mm -hmm. It means more likelihood of debt crises. The U.S. has an interest, an economic and, right. a, and a geopolitical interest in debt crises, and it makes policy coordination, where the U.S. plays a key role, much more important. Your father was ambassador of Egypt to France. Mr. Macron is in France right now. Again, let's bring this back to this morning's jobs report. This gap between the United States and China is tangible. How does that affect the spirit of the American economy as seen by this jobs report? So first of all, that gap is not only tangible, it's long lasting. It is not going to go away. Um, it reflects national security considerations. It reflects uneven um, adherence to international mm -hmm. standards. So this thing is not going to go away. What it means is fragmented globalization. The U.S. has right. to think differently. Multinationals have to think differently about how they deal with, with globalization. But, but, Tom, we're in a better place than many other countries, in a much better place. Right. To are we, are this. We, this is right where I wanted to go. We're going to do a panel. I'm going to be with Dr. Larian in a panel at the IMF a, we, uh, a week from today, actually, with Olivier Blanchard and uh, Gita Gopinath. I, I, this is critical. We have the advantage of a technology overlay. How does that change the action of the chairman of the Federal Reserve to know he has the trump card, no pun intended, he has the trump card of American technological excellence? It won't change anything in the short term. But it does change in the long term. We, not, we don't just have that trump card. We also have an incredibly diverse economy. We are much more energy um, independent than, than most other countries. And we have incredible entrepreneurships. We have to navigate three major transformations over the medium term. Doesn't impact the Fed today, but will impact the Fed later on. One is the green energy transition, absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. Two is the digital transition, absolutely critical. And then three is the supply chain transition, absolutely critical. It is, what's critical to me, John, is all that matters is if you see 110,000 print on Friday's jobs report, all the stuff at 60,000 feet with Dr. Larian drifts away. Can we pick up on point three, the supply chain shift? Adam Poston at the Peterson Institute earlier this week said that maybe it was a bit of a fallacy to believe that bringing supply chains home increases resilience of the supply chain. Now, I think we know that based on what's happened with some command economies over economic history. Do you think that is also a bit of a fallacy? Look, it depends what you think the supply chain is most sensitive to. If it's most sensitive to geopolitical shock, then bringing it closer, French shoring, near shoring, certainly increases your resilience. If you think of it as being subject to other risks, then Adam has, has a point. But I think the focus right now, John, is on national security, on geopolitical issues. That is what's driving the government-led fragmentation of globalization. There's also the private sector-led fragmentation of globalization when companies want to have more sources of supply. So you'll remember it was only five minutes ago we were talking about the secular component of the inflation story. And then that all went away after the banking crisis. But that's still something we need to focus on, isn't it? Don't we face higher inflation rates because of everything you describe? Oh, absolutely. Thank you for bringing it up. One of my biggest frustration has been excessive data dependence. Not data dependence, excessive data dependence. You've got to be anchored by some strategic view of the economy. And this Fed, unfortunately, hasn't embraced a strategic view. The only one it has comes from the new monetary framework, which is built for the world of yesterday the world of deficient aggregate demand. Today and for the next few years, we're in a world of deficient aggregate supply. That has an inflation bias to it and makes the Fed's job even more difficult. Do you think the Fed is aware of that? Have they acknowledged that sufficiently? I think they've been excessively data dependent. I think they are, they are standing behind um, data dependency because they don't want to be held accountable for yet another mistake. How can we hold them accountable? I've got to jump in. Luigi Zingales a man you know well from the Chicago school, said this to us yesterday. He said, in the last two years, the Fed has failed twice. It has failed to see inflation coming. It's failed to see the banking crisis coming. He really believes there's an institutional problem at the Federal Reserve. Do you believe it's a leadership issue or is there something wrong with that institution? They have two significant structural deficiency. And I've talked about this because it's been failures of analysis, policymaking, communications and forecasts. That is significant. So failure number one is accountability. You either have endogenous accountability, 
And as the professor said, they still haven't owned their mistakes. The ECB has owned its mistake. The Bank of England has. The Fed has not. So either you have endogenous accountability, which is important because you learn from your mistakes, or you have exogenous accountability. They don't have that either. Mm. So the first issue that they need is accountability, which they don't have. And it's some level between Congress, which focuses on general things, and the internal side, which doesn't own the mistake. You can fix that. The other one they have is lack of cognitive diversity. Unlike the Bank of England, they don't have external members. Unlike the ECB, they don't have a wide range of national governors who, who are constructed in a very different way. So they end up in groupthink. So they get stuck on some narrative, Whoa. transitory inflation, which they don't change. This after the jobs report. First, we've got to really pay attention to this report, John, but I'm sorry, this is the theme with Dr. O'Leary. This is precisely what yeah. Luigi was talking about yesterday, the groupthink at the Federal Reserve. And, and I say it with respect to the institutions, you know, th th there's a whole history of this, but I think the groupthink is 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 profound, and and I love what the Bank of England does. They have Catherine Mann over there. Oh, to Mohammed's point, they have external interest. members yeah. on the NPC. Yeah. Adam Posen was there at one. That Mohammed do this original flower. thing. They dissent. <clears throat> Why won't people at the Fed dissent? We got through that without mentioning QPR. I thought we that did. Was pretty good. That means we get bonus out with Mohammed. Yeah, it's going to be sticking with us. With I'm us. pleased to say. The payrolls report about 18 minutes away. The estimate 230k, <clears throat> and then a little bit later. We'll catch up with the administration. Looking forward to the conversation with the Commerce Secretary a little bit later in the next hour. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says China wants to have it both ways when it comes to the war in Ukraine. In an interview with the European news network Euronews, Blinken said China is trying to advance a ceasefire proposal while also backing Russian President Vladimir Putin. He added China should be focused on urging Russia to respect Ukraine's sovereignty and to give back to the territory it is seized by force. Israel strikes back after the most sustained barrage of rockets launched from Lebanon and Gaza in 17 years. Israeli jets bombed Hamas sites in the Gaza Strip early Friday, causing property damage but no injuries, according to Hamas officials. Israel targeted underground tunnels and sites used for weapons production. In Tennessee, Republican lawmakers have expelled two Democratic colleagues in retaliation for their participation in a gun reform protest from the House floor last week. Justin Jones of Nashville and Justin Pearson of Memphis were stripped of their seats in the first partisan expulsion in the body's history. The Democratic lawmakers had addressed hundreds of people demonstrating in the wake of a shooting at a Nashville Christian school. Replacements will be chosen in a special election later this year. And Tesla is slashing the prices of all of its vehicles in the U.S. It's an effort to shore up weakening demand for its electric vehicles, as CEO Elon Musk vows to chase volume over profit margins. Price tags have been trimmed by $1,000 to $5,000. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. If you look at the Silicon Valley Bank, I don't think that they have a return on assets that justify a higher deposit. That's the conundrum. If the problem were solved simply by increasing rates, it would be easy, but they cannot afford to. So you're saying this banking system does not work with rates of 4% plus. Is that basically what you're saying? Yes. What a fantastic conversation with Luigi Zingales, the professor of finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business yesterday. You can find that in full on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal. We are counting you down to the payrolls report. Welcome to the program. If you are just joining, that payrolls report drops in about 13 minutes' time. The estimate, 230,000. It's coming a bit through the week off the back of a series of downside surprises. Economic data misses through the week, whether it was the ISM business, manufacturing services survey, whether it was the ADP report, jolts, the wrong kind of upside surprise on jobless claims as well. Spooking a few people out there, it's meant a rally in the bond market. The two-year yield started the week close to 4.1%. It's ending the week close to about 380, dependent, Tom, on what we get in about 12 yeah. minutes. I'm watching the 10-year uh, the, the real yield as well. The inflation-adjusted yield, it's come in, and I'm waiting for a 0.99 statistic, which to me is a big deal, but Priya Misra earlier saying the distance to gloom there is near a 0% 10-year real yield. We're not there yet. Equity futures, TK, down about two-tenths yeah. of 1%.
We are so privileged on this special jobs report and all of our coverage, including our team showing up on radio and on television, to just have sterling guests uh, with us. Joining us on set is Mohammed El Aryan of the University of Cambridge, among other abilities, and joining us with great ability from the University of Chicago Booth School, as always, is a former Federal Reserve Governor, Randall Krosner. Randy, I want to go off financial economics with you. You own the high ground here. What is the measurement of uncertainty? that we have, not so much on this jobs report, but where we are right now in studying the American economy. That's a very important point, because one of the issues that people have been debating is uh, the inflation dynamics and job market dynamics. That, you know, is there something that's different than uh, the way that people have traditionally thought about it? And the Fed's been at this a while, and interest rates have gone up a lot. And of course, you know, another uh, uh, University of Chicago economist, a very great one, Milton Friedman, had said there are long and variable lags and the impact of uh, monetary policy. But man, it's it's, it's a long uh, a long slog, my, more than a year that the Fed has been tightening, and we really haven't seen the labor market crack. That's kind of what people are looking for today. Are we seeing signs of the, the labor market cracking? Uh, right. And when it comes, maybe it'll come a lot more rapidly than uh, than in the past. A lot more rapidly. My history, and this is not the sophistication of Frank Knight or George Stigler on to Friedman and on to Krosner, but just the blunt instrument is that when it slows down, recessions happen rapidly. Is that your take, that when they go, they really go? Yeah, I think our models often say things move very smoothly and gradually, but I think it's often the case in the labor market that it can move pretty rapidly. And, and that's one of the things that uh, the Fed worries about and that, of course, um, economists and, uh, and business people worry about, that could the, uh, this what seems to be an extremely robust job market move rapidly into one that is not so robust. So, Randy, given the long and variable lags point you just made, are we excessively data dependent? Do we get whipsawed all the time? When I look at what has happened to the two years, um, in the last 30, 30 days, it's a 150 basis point swing, makes even cash management really hard, causes all sorts of issues. At what point can we step back from every data point and take a longer term view and rather than get whipsawed like this, like we have been? Yeah, I think that would be super great. But I think part of the reason for that is this uncertainty about the underlying model. I think when people sort of um, not only the Fed, but uh, the markets have kind of the same uh, same broad model of how the labor market works and inflation dynamics, then you don't get these these sorts of whipsaws. Um, now, because of, of so much uncertainty about what the underlying model is, you get uh, some strong reports, uh, the uh, interest rates go up, you get some uh, slightly weak report, reports, the interest rates go down quite a bit. Uh, so, and then, of course, you've got the tumult of the uh, the, uh, the banking tumult in the background, and I think that's made things even more fragile. There's been a lot of criticism about forward policy guidance. There was a recent study that showed that volatility during the press conference is three times as high as it's been in the past, and the message tends to be inconsistent with the message of the statement that was issued just before the press conference. Are you, are you surprised by the outcome of that result? Yeah, I think that's uh, well. I don't know about the, the particulars of the volatility during the uh, during the press conference, but um, uh, but actually, Jonathan and I had uh, talked about this in, uh, um, a month ago. Uh, so I think that the uh, I think that the Fed's message is quite consistent and quite clear. Ever since the markets didn't believe Jay Powell at the beginning of July a year ago uh, that they really made inflation the number one priority and uh, they're going to keep at it until inflation comes down, you know, he ripped up the traditional. Jackson Hole speech, made it much shorter, just eight minutes, and he said the same thing eight times, which is what I just, just said. And I think they've, they've kept at it. Now, of course, you know, the data have come in in different ways, and so they can't tell you exactly, is it 25 basis points, 50 basis points, 75 basis points? But I think the overall message has been, been, uh, been fairly consistent. Randy, you know I'm going to take the other side of this, but sure, we've known each other great. a long time, so I'm going to jump in. Mohammed, that is the establishment view of the Federal Reserve and Chairman Powell. And there are many people watching this program who just listen to that and just think, what's Randy talking about? Consistent. I heard the speech, we were in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, eight minutes long, got it, great. And then there was a conversation in December where he seemed to back away from it. Then he started talking about disinflation. 
the disinflationary process has started at the time where the economic data was super robust. Do you think the Fed's been as consistent as Randy Krosner is suggesting? So I would love to agree with Randy, my friend, but the answer is no. It has been inconsistent. Um, this inflation was mentioned over 10 times on February 1st. Once you mention that word ten, over 10 times, you send a signal and the markets moved in a major way. So, Randy, um, I would love to agree with you because I think this volatility is actually breaking things and it's unnecessary. But it's not because the message has been consistent. It's because the message has been inconsistent. Inflation started to come down, so he started to talk about disinflation. I mean, that's what the data are saying. So I don't see any inconsistency with uh, with saying that. Do, they... Do you want to jump in? No, no, I think I'll leave you. <laughs> Randy, we're going to continue this conversation around the table. I know you're going to join us after the payrolls report, so thanks for being with us. We're going to do that in about six minutes' if time. If he stays around. <laughs> I think Randy's going to stick around. We did this last time. No, this look, is the debate. Look, this is the debate. Randy's yeah. put out his point. Mohammed, essentially, it's the... The Fed changed because the data changed. You don't share that view. I think you cannot be overly data dependent. It's like, I mean, I can well, give you many examples where that causes accidents. You've got to have a view of where you're going. You've got to have a view of your destination. This is critical. We talked about Chicago economics and, you know, the privilege of talking to the laureate Michael Spence studying under John Hicks. Let's go from John Hicks to the laureate Michael Spence to Mohammed El Aryan. Is any of that theory along the way apt now? I mean, beg, the textbook beg. I don't know if they use it at Cambridge. Is any of this in the textbook in the United Kingdom beg? So the most important insight here comes from Mike Spence, which is the importance of signaling and what happens when you get asymmetrical signaling and how markets break down. I mean, don't underestimate the role that the Fed plays. We all embrace the Fed. We all embrace its political independence because it, it anchors the system. If it no longer anchors the system, then you get so financial accidents, you get economic accidents. And the rest of the world, to quote a, a FT article by Edward Luce, starts hating the Fed because right. they see it as a source of instability. We've got to go here and, and get to this important jobs report. For Dr. Elarian, very simply here, if it is an asymmetrical theory right now, where does a pause fit in? Which way does a pause tilt? Um, that is really difficult. If they didn't have a credibility problem, the pause fits in really well. But they're also dealing with a credibility problem. So that is why they haven't changed their narrative. Got a great message that I think Mohammed's going to agree with, and maybe not Randy. The Fed has been consistent lately consistently wrong. It's the message I just got on the I'm, Bloomberg. I'm not that harsh. I'm with Dr. Krasner. The payrolls report, four minutes away. The payrolls report, seconds away, the number, the estimate, 230K. Mike McKee's going to break this down for you. Going into it, equity futures That's negative, a little more than a tenth of 1% the on the S&P. Number. I'm not going to share the whisper number with you okay. right now Does Mike because people it? might confuse that with the actual number, <laughs> which hasn't come out yet. In the bond market, going into it, 383 on a two-year yield. That yield much lower on the week off the back of weaker economic data. With the jobs report around the table, Mike McKee, this one, a couple of seconds late, Mike. Yeah, well, maybe the computers are thinking it's Good Friday and they're taking a little bit of time to get this done. But we have the number now and the economists win. 236,000 is the total for the month of March. 230,000 was the estimate. And of course, it was 311 last month on an unrevised basis. We're waiting for the revision number to drop at this point. Change in private payrolls, 189. Wow. That's down from 265. So there is a significant government component to this. We'll have to check out what that is. Uh, manufacturing payrolls fall by 1,000. They were down 4,000 in February. The unemployment rate ticks down down to 3.5% from 3.6%. That's going to be uh, also an interesting discovery right there. Uh, and we're looking at average hourly earnings come in at 3 tenths. That's a uh, tick up from last month, but uh, right as expected. And it puts the year-over-year -year number at 4.2% down from 46 um, That is sort of a, a base effect change. So I don't know how much money... Uh, the, uh, Credence, the Fed's going to put it in, in terms of an inflation uh, signal, but it is good news. And average weekly hours come in at 34.4. That's down from uh, 34.5. 
Labor force participation rate, 62.6 from 62.5. More people working. That gives us a clue as to why the unemployment rate uh, went down. I'll take a look at the rest of the numbers while John leads you through the markets, and I'm sure and there's a market moved. reaction. Yeah, there is, and I'm going to jump in and say this. Tom was right to ask what is the whisper number, because when we talk about 236K relative to 230, that's relative to what economists were looking for. Market participants who had put a bid into the two-year yield, the two-year through most of this week off the back of weaker data we're looking for a weaker print without a doubt about that yeah yields are up at the front end now by 11 basis points on a two-year to close to 395 on a two-year yield i will say this worth noting that things are pretty quiet on good friday so read into these moves what you will but keep that in the back of your mind so that's the move in the bond market equity futures turning just a little bit higher by a tenth of one percent on the s p 500 but tom certainly that move at the front end of the curve gets my attention up 11 basis points on a two-year yes that print is in line but i would say this based on the data we've had so far this week in line is a beat. In line, a uh, absolutely, in line's a beat, and you're seeing that in the market and the correlations are even with a 10-year real yield moving higher as well by five uh, basis points. The granularity that Mike McKee's expert at as he digs into pages and pages of data, the underemployment rate, which is really not au courant, but the fact is the underemployment rate gives us a better statistic than last month. That's not what we're supposed to see, as we heard Anna Wong say. This is a chairman that wants a 4.x percent unemployment rate. The micro data does doesn't show that. Mike, you got a second look? Yeah, let's take a look at some of the categories of jobs. Leisure and hospitality helping lead the way this time. 72,000, lower than the average monthly gain of about 95,000 over the last six months. Food and drinking up 50,000. They're still trying to fill all the jobs they lost when the pandemic broke out. Uh, leisure and hospitality still 2.2% below its pre-pandemic level. Government employment, we mentioned, that increased by 47,000. But according to BLS, that's about in line with its average. And here's an interesting thing. There was an article ahead of the jobs report that suggested that we would see a decline in temporary services, uh, employment and professional and business services, and that would be a sign that the economy is cooling off. But instead, they go up by 39,000. So uh, that is not <laughs> there's not a canary in that coal mine. Healthcare, always a uh, big category, adds 34,000 jobs. That's down from where they were, if you want to look at some sort of canary there. Uh, and transportation and warehousing has been an interesting one because it went up so much during the years that we were seeing everybody go to internet shopping. Uh, now it changed very little. About 10,000 uh, couriers and messengers, 7,000 uh, jobs. Those are the jobs of the people who deliver all those packages to you. So uh, it looks like uh, this is a sort of a status quo report. Retail jobs were down by uh, 15,000, but uh, not uh, a significant drop given uh, the situation, and that may be the seasonal effects. So, uh, as I say, this looks very much like a sort of status quo. Not a lot happened during the month that changed employers' views. We did see uh, in the Beige Book and in the minutes that uh, people were telling, the last minutes, uh, people were telling Fed officials that uh, they were holding on to workers for right now until they got a better gauge of what was happening in the overall economy. Mike, thank you. 236 is the number. 230. The estimate, the consensus estimate, the median expectation in our survey. Mohammed, your take on this one? So two comments in terms of implications. One, for the Fed, this increases the probability that they'll go 25 basis points in early May. Of course, the CPI number is going to be important. But given this, this does not justify a pause given how they've been thinking. Second, it's good to see good economic news um, in terms of high labor force participation, in terms of the unemployment rate coming down, being also good news for the S&P, for stocks, which tells you that we are making this transition where the stock market was obsessed with interest rate risk to one where it's concerned about credit risk. And this number here suggests that it should be less concerned about credit risk for the moment. Randall Krosner with us as well, the former governor of the Federal Reserve, of course, the University of Chicago Booth School. Professor Krosner, when I look at this data and what Dr. Elarian says about clearly optimistic data, I want you to speak to the optimistic market economists that say there's more going on than traditional economic analysis, that this is an America resilient how do you see that at Booth School? 
Well, this is something we've talked about before, and I've called the so-called immaculate disinflation, that uh, somehow, because uh, inflation is gradually coming down, that we can uh, do this without the labor market cracking, without uh, uh, really feeling much pain. I think that's a little bit too positive. I think um, people would be a little bit concerned to say, oh, well, we'll just be able to uh, to make it all work, uh, work very easily. Um, one thing that was uh, at least heartening in the... Uh, in the report is that uh, the um, uh, changes in wages seem to be cons be roughly where the well exactly on where the um, uh, the forecast was, um, so that's down a bit from where things had been. Uh, so we're seeing still a reasonably robust labor market, but not quite as much wage pressure. Um, I very much agree with with Mohammed. I think the Fed has been well. I would say the Fed's been very clear, and that makes it very easy to uh, to say that uh, unless something wild happens in the next uh, next few weeks they're going to go 25 basis points and then it's likely that they're um, they may pause uh, obviously that'll relate to how the uh, uh, how the in inflation report comes out right uh, but they're getting into the fives and that's something that you know we've talked about for for many months that I think that's where the Fed was going I think they made it fairly clear that that's that's where they were going and they're probably going to pause right. five and five and a half. Uh, Governor Krosner, I, I look at the one million jobs formed off revisions of the last 90 days. The three-month uh, moving average is 355,000. That is a booming job economy under any theory. How distant is Jerome Powell from his higher unemployment that he desires? Yeah, so as I said, you know, the, the Fed's the Fed's not going to quit until the labor market quits, and the labor market has not yet quit uh, because I think the the view is still it's going to be very difficult to bring inflation down in a consistent and uh, and permanent way until you see some more weakness in the uh, more weakness in the job market. Fortunately, we don't see wages uh, wage growth accelerating, uh, but it's not come down nearly as much as as. Uh, John, Jerome this is Powell. just, just extraordinary. I mean, are we back to a Bullard 7% in the last four minutes? No. <laughs> I, I'm looking at 355,000 jobs per month. Well, here's the interesting thing that's happened that happened in the last month. When you look at that household survey, uh, the labor force grew by 480,000, which the Fed has been expecting. More people come into the labor force, and maybe that's bringing down the JOLTS jobs numbers. And of those coming into the labor force, more people got jobs, 577,000, while unemployment fell by 97,000. There was a big dichotomy between the establishment survey and the household survey for a couple of months. It looks like household is now catching up. 236 is the number. We haven't had a downside surprise on a payroll report in 12 months. Ronnie Krosner, thank you, of the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Sarah House standing by, senior economist at Wells Fargo. Sarah, you've had some time to pour through this one. What stands out for you? Yeah, so I mean, I think overall this, there's a lot for the Fed to like in here in that we are seeing signs of the labor market cooling down, but in an orderly way. And we're seeing some balance creep back into the jobs market. So whether we're looking at some of the demand indicators we've gotten over the course of, of the week, but also I think one encouraging aspect here is that you did see that labor force participation rate tick up for a fourth consecutive month. And that's really how the Fed would like to bring the labor market back in, into balance. So unfortunately, their tools work more on demand but seeing that supply side is an encouraging sign for that prospect of, of a soft landing in terms of average hourly earnings cooling, but because you businesses have more workers available to them and, and can continue to, to hire at a decent pace. Sarah, is there any kind of disconnect whatsoever between what we're witnessing this morning in this report and what we've seen so far over the last week? Well, I think overall the payrolls still remain very buoyant compared to the other labor market data that we've seen that I think have pretty consistently shown that the labor market is, is clearly softening. So you see that whether we're looking at some of the job postings data we saw earlier this week with the with the JOLTS report, the private sector in Indeed postings, I think the unemployment insurance claims which showed that, look, the trend over the past year is actually pretty flat, but we've definitely seen it move higher here. So that's kind of the, the flip side of, of businesses looking forward 
for, for new workers is how much they're hanging on to existing workers. Mm -hmm. And so to some extent, I think the, the non-farm payroll numbers remain surprisingly high against some of these measures, including the PMIs. But I think it shows right. that you know overall the, the labor market remains pretty strong. Sarah, let's dovetail your work with Dr. L. Arians. I'm going to ask you a Mohammed question. That's what they're called worldwide, folks. When you ask some fancy Cambridge question of Mohammed, it's a Mohammed uh, question. Sarah House, what is the T decision in front of Chairman Powell as we move not only to May, but to the summer meetings of the Fed? What is the this way or that way decision that Chairman Powell will have to make? Well, I think it's very much dependent on do we continue to see the, the worst part of the stress in the banking system over where they can focus on inflation and the jobs market. But I think it all still really comes down to inflation, the inflation pressures we're seeing. So we think that the Fed is still on track to, to hike again in May, in large part because we just don't think we're seeing a convincing downward trend in inflation quite yet. So I don't think they're going to get enough data. And even with the, the March uh, with the March CPI report, it's still going to be pointing to a, a pretty strong trend. So I think they're still very much focused on that, probably allows for a hike in May. But I do think they're getting to the point where they're thinking more about those cumulative lags, where you are starting to see some broader softening in the economy, whether it's the jobs market, whether it's um, some of the some of the activity gauges like, like the PMIs. And so I do think that gets them still pretty close to, to the point where they, they go on hold and wait to see how the medicine takes. Sarah, so can we ask you to focus on the services sector? Because that's the, the, the one area that may result in much more sticky inflation than anybody would like. Um, how much should we take out of this number compared to the ISM? And in particular, how will that reconcile what is still a very big difference between whether market sees rates ending up this year and what the Fed has told us about where rates are going to end up? Right. So I think you're, you're spot on in terms of the service sector really holds the key in, in terms of how fast inflation comes down and whether the Fed is able to pull off this, this soft landing. So I think there's a lot of disinflationary forces coming through the good side of, of the economy, just given the spending patterns that we've seen and, and how much prices ran ran up. But it is that, that services side. And I think what we've seen in terms of the hiring numbers, the leisure and hospitality, the fact um, that um, that you're you know, still seeing some pretty strong gains in professional and business services shows that, you know, despite the step down in, in the ISM services we saw earlier this week, that side of the economy continues to, to, move, to move along. And so I think that's going to be really important in terms of how that market pricing and what the Fed eventually does play out, since that's really the last, the last vestige of inflation that the Fed needs to, to figure out. So let me put you on the spot, if I may. Um, let's f fast forward to December. Who do you think is going to end up being right, the market or the Fed? So we, we'd lean more towards the market at this point. So we're expecting the Fed to begin cutting in, in December as we do see the economy slipping into recession in the second half of this year and the unemployment rate rising to about 4.5%. And so we think in, in the face of that clearly weakening in economic activity and those inflation pressures continuing to subside, yeah. that at that point, the, the Fed... The Fed does go ahead and, and begin to ease a little bit, but there, you know, this isn't a recession that would take the Fed back down right. to zero. We think this is just moving more towards a, a neutral policy rather than an outright restrictive. John, we got to reset here, but can I just point out: Is Muhammad auditioning for our jobs? Is, Have you is, not seen this happen on the nine o'clock? I, I know. Oh, he it's comes just on the like, open and does this all the time. I, you know. And I tell him afterwards, will you stop asking better questions than me? <laughs> <laughs> Sarah House, thank you of Wells Fargo. Just to reset for you all on TV and radio, if you are just tuning in, welcome to the programme. It is Good Friday. The equity market will not open at 9.30 Eastern like it typically does, but we have got some payrolls data for you. The payrolls data reads as follows. 236,000 was the number. The median estimate was 230,000. We have not had a downside surprise on a payrolls report since the March report of last year, which we got in early April. We thought we might get a downside surprise this morning because we've had a series of it's downside surprises number. through the week so far. To Tom's point on the whisper number, <laughs> that which out. you're only half joking about, <laughs> The whisper number was for a much, much softer number. And what do we mean by the whisper number? Basically, people on markets, not economists, market participants, looked at the data <coughs> so far this week, saw it was weak, put a rally into the front end of the curve, yields lower on a two-year. And maybe, I think Tom in line this morning, is an upside surprise relative to what we've seen so far this week. Yeah, no question. So yields at the front end up a little bit. I will say this about the market reaction, though, Tom, and I think it's worth saying. It is Good Friday. 
There it aren't is, many people it, around desk doing this stuff. It, it is a good Friday right now. We're going to digress here. We have a wonderful effort here for another 15 minutes with Mike McKee dropping, uh, digging into the data as well, and Dr. Alarian uh, with us. I want to pause here for the public service of Mohammed Alarian, and there's a photo out in his Twitter feed. On radio, it's real simple. It is the students of Queens College, Cambridge, with the Beast Bosa. This is the official dog of the University of Cambridge. And, Mohammed, I want to just pause for a bit here. And this is on Good Friday. Now, you studied with Erasmus at Cambridge years ago. And the problem is John Fisher had your job a few years ago, and he ran into an altercation with Henry VIII. you got to be careful at Cambridge when you're, when you're there. It's an, it's an emotional place. What's been your experience dealing with these students? What's been the biggest surprise of your day job now? So for those of you who don't know English history as well as Tom does, John Fisher, who was the president of Queens, got beheaded. And he got <laughs> beheaded by Henry VIII. Um, so look, this, it's been an amazing experience with the students. I cannot tell you how exciting it is to see them embrace the opportunity they're giving. And you're seeing transformation right in front of your eyes. I, I experienced it. So I see it repeated over and over again. Yeah. And it happens especially to, to people who come from more difficult backgrounds and who recognize that this is life-changing not just for them, but for subsequent generations. Tell me about the elites that you're living with, and frankly, we are every day, maybe not at Cambridge, but we're in an elite world. What is your optimism seeing this jobs report of an America that's essentially flat on its back? Half of America is struggling just to get by. So, so I do think we have an inequality problem. I call it a trifecta, income, wealth, and in particular, opportunity. And I think a lot has to be done to try and level the playing field on opportunity. Having said that, this is not an economy on its um, knees. This is an economy that's incredibly robust and only gets down to, it, to its knees if there is further policy mistakes. I'm actually quite encouraged by how well the U.S. economy has been doing, given what else has been going on in the world. Well, I just want to point out, because we're talking about inequality in the world, uh, this is a really, really good report for uh, minorities. The unemployment rate for blacks or African-Americans drops from 5.7 to 5 percent, a seven-tenths drop in one month. Asian unemployment drops by six-tenths to 2.8 wow. percent, and Hispanic drops by seven-tenths to 4.6 percent. Uh, this is only conjecture, but it seems like when you uh, are have this kind of continuing improvement in the labor Labor market, it is getting to the people who are last hired, to the people at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale who didn't get the jobs back right away, and it seems to be broadening. So this is the question that people ask, Mohammed. To Mike's point, the labor market looks okay in this labor market report. Some people might disagree based on other figures we've had this week, but let's just go with this. Why does the Fed want to ruin it? That's the question you often hear asked. Why do they want to ruin this? Why do they want to get unemployment? higher. I think a lot of people outside of Wall Street and the Federal Reserve, the institution, don't quite understand that. Can you make sense of that for us? So the charitable interpretation is because they're not getting enough help on the supply side. And if we did more to enhance labor force participation, they wouldn't have to do so much on the demand side. That's the charitable side. The less charitable is they started very late. And because they started very late, they are, they are having a, a lot of hikes in a very <coughs> short amount of time, which then creates more damage to the real economy than you would have had otherwise had you started on time. And I think there's general agreement that they started very late, probably a year late. The uh, Fed's argument, and I'll, t I'll take the Randy Krosner side for, for right now, <laughs> is that the, they think they can tighten the way they are tightening because there were so many job openings left over after the pandemic. The people are filling those holes rather than unemployment rising. We saw yesterday the jobless claims numbers, which the, when they changed the seasonally adjusted factors, went right. up by about 30,000, but they're still very low and not showing signs of breaking out. There does seem to be also, because it was so hard to find workers, a labor hoarding thing going on where I, companies are reluctant to let people go. So the Fed is maybe gambling at this point that they can get away with this, but it's paying okay. off. I'm going to take the Elizabeth Warren side. We've created a million oh, jobs go. in 90 days. <laughs> you just gave us stunning diversity statistics. 
of the minorities of America prospering. John, is this maybe the best jobs report I've ever seen? A million jobs in 90 days in different minority unemployment that I never imagined or framed in my head. Well, you know what people are going to say back to that, Tom? Just wait. Just wait. Just wait based on the tightening we've had in 12 months, zero to five. Potentially in the coming meeting on May 3rd, they go beyond five. <clears throat> and Mohammed, on top of that, the banking stress, an extra layer of it. I just think there's a big group of individuals right now on Wall Street, market participants looking at this data point this morning and saying, great, OK, wait a few, couple of months because it's going to get worse. Is that your take? Um, that's the fear. That is the fear. And I worry about it every single day. My question for you. Yeah. If I add up all the numbers you've given us, Hispanic down from 5.3 to 4.6, um, black unemployment 5.7 to 5, Asian 3.4 to 2.8, that means white unemployment must have spiked higher in a very big way. Well, I can check that out very quickly here. White unemployment obviously has been very, very low. Uh, at this point, white unemployment is uh, yeah. unchanged. Okay, so that, so, so that doesn't add up. So uh, if everything else goes down and white is is unchanged, so uh, well you can come with me tomorrow to the um, <laughs> Bureau of Labor Statistics. There and, we are, and talk to them. I, <laughs> around the table here, but, and moment, I want to celebrate Mike McKee's work here, talking with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, talking to the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, talking to the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and I want to go back to something. This is John so important because it's what surveillance does, and McKee lives. Every day. And folks, you don't know this, but Alarian on the side is a songwriter. Here's Alarian off of one of his key songs for Hamilton a number of years ago. And the lyrics of this are just important and go really right to the idea of what the Fed uh, will do. Talk less, what? Smile more. Don't let them know what you're against or what you're for. You can't be serious. You want to get ahead. Fools who run their mouths off wind up dead. You wrote about this. I didn't quite write about that whole thing. Um, <laughs> but let me, let me, I just want to join you because, Mike, you are amazing. Oh, I always listen well, to you. you. I end up having, because of you, many more insights than I would otherwise. And the way you interview federal officials and your questions at the FOMC press conference are just terrific. So are thank you. Are talking too much? Oh, absolutely. They're talking too much. I, I think... Just talk to former federal officials, see how they feel about the amount well, of— the, the, the follow-on to that that they would give you is, <clears throat> would you rather we go back to the days when nobody spoke? And uh, But that's a false choice. Define. That's a false—talk less doesn't mean don't talk. Well, uh, as, as, as a president of, uh, of a college, when you have a faculty meeting, can you tell uh, members of the faculty to shut up and not speak? Uh, that's kind of the problem. They've got 19 people, 18 at the moment, on the committee, and they're all going to want their chance to say what they think. If Knowing what we know today, would you keep the dots? No, well, you know, I was just asked that by one of the people I interviewed, and I said no. Not because the dots couldn't be helpful, but because they're not. Wall Street does not read them as 19 different dots uh, based on the forecasts that yeah. those people make. They read it as, this is our, pl this is our plan going okay, forward. Okay, so Judge Keene, I rest my case. <laughs> Judge, uh, uh, John, does the Bank of England need dots? Does the Bank of England talk so much? Does the Bank of England talk to Michael McKee like this? Can I have my camera, just my single, just for a moment? <laughs> Mike McKee, you're amazing. <laughs> it's just my turn. It's my turn. <laughs> Mohammed, do you think the Bank of England does this better than the Federal Reserve, don't you? It Just does. the communication. Why? What do they do differently? I think they are less political. They're honest. They say things that may be unpleasant but need to be said. You know, your governor came out and said inflation will go up to 13% if we're not careful. He came out and warned against a wage price spiral. The inflation report was the first to acknowledge that they had made a mistake on transitory. They hiked first. I mean, if you look at, the, at what they do. And then they publish fan charts. And they're honest about the uncertainty. Well, the Fed does publish fan charts. But the now. dots, the Nobody dots, looks at them. no one looks at them. Exactly. Because if you put something else out there, they will look at that. So I, I do think that there's a lot to learn from best practice central banking around the world. And that we have to have an open mind. And we must not get stuck in this lack of cognitive diversity. Because it ends up hurting the American people. It really does. If I could give you one thing right now, would you take the CPI report next week or the bank earnings? What would you like to know up front? If I'm worried about the economy, I would take the bank earnings, um, but more details about bank deposits. I think people 
don't understand what happens to a banking system when money flows out, not just to the large banks, but to the money market sector. It is significantly different in terms of the propensity to lend. And who gets hurt? Small and medium term industries. And they are major job creators. Would you like to stay for an extra hour? We can do this for another 60 minutes if you want. No, I think I, think, be. All right. I, think I, I manage the hour. <laughs> but thank you for having me. Hey, Mike, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you Mama. This was great. You. And to you as well, Mike. Just awesome. Coming up shortly, Nadia Lovell of UBS after the payrolls report comes in firmer than expected, 236,000. The median estimate of economists, 230,000. Futures positive and bond yield tire. From New York, one hour to go. This is Bloomberg. There is an awful lot of really bearish sentiment out there. Fixed income, once again, for investors is behaving as a hedge against falling equity markets. The bias of risk is that the Fed doesn't ease as quickly. What has troubled me, and I think what is troubling the economy right now, is the rapidity with which uh, interest rates have risen. That is what is unprecedented. To get inflation from the levels they're at down towards a 2% path really will take an, a, a recession in the economy. This is a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures right now on the S&P, positive two-tenths of 1%. Some response in the bond market to the payrolls report from about 30 minutes ago. Yields higher at the front end of the curve by eight basis points to 391. The numbers that you want, 236K, that was the headline number. The median estimate in our survey, 230,000. Breaking down the report, here's Mike McKee. Well, John, this was much better than perhaps uh, the whisper number around Wall Street anticipated. As you mentioned, 236,000. We did see the prior months revised down the last two months by 17,000, and that 500,000 job uh, month uh, two months ago has been revised below 500,000, but 477 is still strong. Unemployment drops to 3.5 percent as a lot more people come into the labor force and a lot more of them get jobs. Participation rate ticks up to 62.6 percent, and average hourly earnings come in three-tenths, 4.2 percent. Where the jobs are, leisure and hospitality gained 72,000, and government 47,000. Those were the biggest categories. But check this out. Goods producing jobs for the first time in many months lost uh, 7,000 jobs, while services it added 196,000. It's a pattern we know has been happening. And I could mention that construction jobs also fell by 9,000. Real estate jobs also fell by about that much. So that is one sector that's hurting. And average hourly earnings is your story of the day, really, because it comes in much lower. And on a quarterly basis, and this is Omar Sharif uh, writing in from Inflation Insights, 3.2% uh, for the first quarter as a three-month seasonally adjusted average, which is just right in the Fed's range for where they think the uh, wage numbers should be to have a sustainable inflation rate. So it, it has come way down. It was 4.9 percent, now 3.2 percent on an annualized basis. So uh, wages coming down, and uh, that is another good news point for the Fed. So that's payrolls, Mike. Let's shift gears and push forward to the calendar next week. April 12th, the inflation report. I'm just going to go through the headline numbers for you all at home, just a sneak peek of our survey so far. Month over month headline, 0.2% is the survey, 0.4% is the previous number. Strip out food energy, what we call core, 0.4% is the estimate, 0.5% the previous number. Year over year, Mike, we're expecting inflation to come down from 6 to 5.2%, but for core, to go from 5.5 to 5.6. Similar story in Europe at the moment. Mike, just how sticky is the core inflation story? Well, it's going to be sticky for a month or two. Then we're going to see the drop in rent levels really hit this number, and it should come down a lot. And that's what the Fed and other economists who think will get down to 3 3 3.5% by the end of the year are counting on, that we're going to see the uh, real estate numbers uh, drop and housing will uh, drop significantly as an inflation causer, and uh, then we will have right. a much lower sustainable number going forward. So we'll be watching that uh, core X housing number, that, uh, the <coughs> Yeah. Uh, Fed chairman talks about a lot. The wonderful Ian Lingen publishing, Mike, and he says flat out, Fed cleared to hike. Do you agree with that? 
Yes. I mean, I know it's not your job. I to mean, give it they opinion, have but. their forecast in the dots plot that Mohammed was talking about. The consensus of everybody's view is right. that the, the median consensus is that they're going to go to 5.1 percent. So if you think that that's where you needed to go, right. then you're going to go there, I, and then they're going to hold, I think. I don't think I, they go I, higher than that. I have to slip this in with the grievous tension that we saw in the last hour with Dr. <laughs> El Arian. Are there people at the Fed, Mike, that agree with Mohammed El Arian that there have been missteps? Is it is it yeah, part sure. of the dialogue within sure. the Eccles yeah. building? No, they do talk about that. They were late getting to it. And an unappreciated fact, I think, is uh, we all look back now and wonder why they didn't stop quantitative easing uh, earlier than they mm -hmm. did. And one of the reasons was because of this bank uh, question that uh, the, some of the bank's assets, uh, they wanted to give them time to reset. They knew they'd have to go up fast on the Fed funds rate. So they wanted to help banks reset. And uh, I've been told they were talking about this whole question of mismatch uh, duration in the, uh, in the banks uh, early last fall. We've criticised them a lot for groupthink, and I'm totally on board with that. I think it's a problem and something we need to address. But when you go through the summary of economic projections, Mike, I go to 2024 and just look at the range of dots from 3.4 to 5.6, 25 for whatever that's worth from 2.4 to 5.6. That doesn't sound like groupthink. When you actually look at the range of expectations, yeah. it really doesn't at all. No, it's not. Uh, and there is, they will all tell you, nobody really knows what's going to happen. This has been such a confusing time for the economy that they can't put their finger on where things are going to be. And so there is a very wide dispersion for 2020. 24 and 2025. Normally you get that dispersion out two years because who knows what's going to happen over two years. But we even have that for next year. 2024, just eight months away. This year's dragging though. I mean, this year feels like a decade already, doesn't it? Q1 uh, we, and uh, you a know, couple of weeks, a week. We, we, John, you and I don't have jobs. <laughs> Maki has a real job. You and I don't. Guess what? This is exhausting. Oh, week without a doubt. Week, without it's a just doubt. exhausting. Nadia Lovell's with us now, senior U.S. equity <clears throat> strategist over at UBS Global Wealth Management. Nadia, wonderful to catch up with you. You've had about 36 minutes to process, digest these numbers. What do you make of them? You know, I, I think, Jonathan, the term for so far this year might just be the resiliency, uh, not only in the economic data, just given how strong we've had the job market be, that it's really given the consumer the confidence to continue to spread. But I would also say, even in the stock market, despite the volatility that we have seen in the banking sector. But that said, I mean, we are starting to see some signs of crack in the leading indicators, as well as the more real-time data, whether you look at ISM this week or some of the uptake in terms of jobless claim. And so those cracks could really start to turn into craters. You also have a market now that's trading at the higher end of its six months range and valuation is quite extended. And so we do think that the market remains vulnerable, particularly as if there's any bad news, that narrative right. will really take hold. Um, and so, uh, you know, next week we'll get the kickoff of the earnings season. So we'll be watching that very closely. I mean, the bar has been lowered, so maybe companies can, right. can um, indeed be I want to dovetail the economics of the moment, uh, Nadia, with your wonderful work in equities. And I want to center it around uh, folks joining us, I believe, on Monday is Adam Tooze, who is front and center in the firmament of what we're thinking right now. Professor Tooze will join us. And Nadia, he is very much centered on uh, the illusion of inflation on nominal GDP. Is the unspoken surprise forcing us to look at S&P 4100 that we're going to see better nominal GDP, that we're going to see better revenues, and that will make the grimness of earning shortfalls less. No, I, I don't think so. I think that you are going to start to see some softness to the top line to revenues. Um, you also, companies are struggling to continue to pass on any sort of price increases to their customers. And so we do expect some margin squeeze this year. You know, of course, I do think that the consensus is expecting that earnings kind of trough in the first half of the year and a, a real inflection in the second half of the year for earnings growth of sort of mid single digits. But we think that there's just continues to be a risk to the south downside as the economy slows. And if and if inflation does indeed get it under control, I mean, obviously, that has further implications for even more pressures on um, earnings in the back half of the year. When you speak to your securities analysts, sector by sector, industry by industry, will we see more federal expresses with some sharp strategic restructuring? I think so. You're already seeing a lot of companies tighten their belt and really uh, 
focus on e efficiency. And I think that that's going to separate some of those these companies that will be able to withstand an economic downturn as we get into the back half of the year into 2024. We think that you're going to see more cost control. And so those are the kind of companies that you want to focus on, those higher quality companies that might be able to, to sort of weather any economic downturn. The year of efficiency, Meta, year today, flying. <laughs> Is Meta one of those companies? I mean, I'm serious, Nadia. I'm trying to work out what is a high-quality company at the moment, what's defensive in the era that we're in at the moment and the conditions we're about to approach. And a lot of people think those conditions get weaker. Yet today, as you know, the leadership has come from tech. The Nasdaq is up more than 15% on the year so far, Nadia. Where do you think the leadership comes from? We do think that the leadership is going to come from the more defensive side of the market. We actually increase our defensive exposure, even though we have taken down global equities, at least it prefers in favor of high quality corporate bonds. Within equities, we're more defensively uh, positioned. Uh, but we haven't gone full throttle on the defensive side. I mean, we have been favoring consumer staples as well as utilities. But we do maintain some cyclical exposure through industrials. On tech, I mean, yes, we've had very strong performance the other day, just benefit from left life for quality, just given a strong balance sheet within the sector. But reality is, this is a sector that's now trading at a 40% premium to the market, the highest that we've seen in about 15 years. And I think that there's this perception that tech is particularly defensive. But remember, while they have strong balance sheet, their customers might not have the same access to cash that they do and will suffer from tightening lending standards. And that's going to impact the band as well as IT budgets. And then when you look at the real part of tech that's really valid, it's been the more cyclical part, semis. And that gives us some pause, Jonathan, here. Hey, Nadia, this was great as always. Nadia Lovell there of UABS Global Wealth Management. Looking at the jobs numbers that came out about 41 minutes ago. 41 minutes ago, we got a print of 236,000. The expectation was 230,000. Got a fantastic lineup of guests for you through the next 50 minutes or so. 9.45 Eastern Time, we'll catch up with the US Commerce Secretary. Before we get there, Robert Tip of PGM, I believe he's going to join us shortly, Tom, Anastasia Amoroso of iCapital, and Tiffany Wilding of PIMCO. Well, it's a strong debate, and it's to get us into this April and after this seismic jobs report, what's next? John, let us reframe here. I'm going to do this off the Standard & Force 500, which is a far more accurate index than the Dow Jones Industrial mm. Average. End of year, 3,800. We're not going to go any higher. 40, well, 4,100, then 4,000. The resiliency of Standard & Poor's 500 at 4,100. No one's modeling out an S&P that can go further. The range, 38 to 42. Yeah. Just how that range now for Who's modeling for a breakout months? here? 4,200 to 43. Dare I say up to 4,600? I don't hear it. Would you like to share the additional programming notice? The Tiger Woods tee-off time. 12.54 p.m. is where Tiger Woods uh, will launch today. It's an emotional Masters. Cold weather scheduled mm. for Augusta. You're built for this. Do some I, golf I, wear green, I guess sort of like a green jacket on here, just in the spirit of this. From New York City on this payroll Friday. The new Friday. par three is exquisite. This is Bloomberg. They put the tee up higher. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Israel strikes back after the most sustained barrage of rockets launched from Lebanon and Gaza in 17 years. Israeli jets bombed Hamas sites in the Gaza Strip early Friday, causing property damage, but no injuries, according to Hamas officials. Israel targeted underground tunnels and sites used for weapons production. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says China wants to have it both ways when it comes to the war in Ukraine. In an interview with the European news network Euronews, Blinken said China is trying to advance a ceasefire proposal while also backing Russian President Vladimir Putin. He added China should be focused on urging Russia to respect Ukraine's sovereignty and to give back to the territory seized by force. In Tennessee, Republican lawmakers have expelled two Democratic colleagues in retaliation for their participation in a gun reform protest from the House floor last week. Justin Jones of Nashville and Justin Pearson of Memphis were stripped of their seats in the first partisan expulsion in the body's history. The Democratic lawmakers had addressed hundreds of people demonstrating in the wake of a shooting at a Nashville Christian school. Replacements will be chosen in a special election later this year. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
for the Fed, this increases the probability that they'll go 25 basis points in early May. Of course, the CPI number is going to be important, but given this, this does not justify a pause given how they've been thinking. That was the brilliant Mohammed Al Arian on with us after those job numbers came out about 46 minutes ago. That job number looked like this, 236,000. The median expectation, 230,000. But you have to do this relative to not just what that number was, but relative, Tom, also to what we had through the week. And what we had through the week was just a series of economic misses. ISM manufacturing, services, downside surprises, ADP, downside surprise. Jobs came in aggressively, claims started to break out. And I think for that reason, Tom, you've asked the question through this morning, what was the whisper number? What the whisper number really was is what does the market think is going to happen here? Well, risk is skewed to a downside surprise because of the data we had so far through the week, and that's yeah. not what happened here. I have a hallway at home, John, loaded with books and many, many textbooks, including Samuelson 1948. Where we are right now is not in Samuelson 48. It's not in Mankiw. It's not in Krugman and all the others, Dornbush, Fisher, Stars. This is absolutely, and Dr. O'Larian, I think, alluded to that. It's absolutely original coming out of the pandemic where we are. And I'm sorry, it's a, mis it's a mystery to everyone. Just going through some of the notes from Alan Ruskin at Deutsche Bank Good. here, Tom. Within NFP, he says gains do look heavily concentrated in leisure and health, together plus 123,000. Construction and manufacturing that are more cyclical are softening. The breakdown is then weaker than the headline, but would still argue the data sends a message of labour market resilience, which I think speaks to what Mohammed was saying and others as well. I think you mentioned Ian Lingen of BMO, yeah. who said clear for liftoff. On May 3rd, right? And, and you mentioned hike. this key date. And let's remember, folks, this is the jobs report before the next Fed meeting. They don't get the joy of an April look in the first week of uh, May. Maybe, you know, John, now that I think about it, they may be briefed on that into the meeting. I wonder if they get a, a, a sneak peek. I think there's a risk here, Tom, we move away from banking stress a little bit too quickly. We've got to pay attention uh, to what's developed is... over the last... We'll have to do another so. hour here. We're going to have to go past 10 a.m., John, if we're going to talk about banking stress. I'll give that a miss. We can come back <laughs> on Monday and do it if you want. We can do it now with Robert Tim, no. Chief Investment Strategist mm -hmm. at PGM Fixed Income. Robert, great to have you on the programme. Welcome and brilliant to see you as always. Let's start with payrolls and then we'll get to markets. Just your thoughts on what we saw 50 minutes ago. Yeah, this is a great number. I mean, there are a lot of questions and you're touching on all the, the key points, but this has been a red hot economy creating so many jobs, creating upward wage pressures, that was giving the Fed pause. We're seeing moderation in the pace of, of job growth. And as one of your earlier guests pointed out, that's what we've wanted to see. Uh, but it's also something that people now are fearing. You know, is it going to dive into a recession? And I think what you were mentioning there about travel and leisure, there are too many areas of this economy within consumption that are too firm, in my mind, to ultimately derail this expansion. But that's going to be an open question for a few months. And, you know, we could be in for another month of, of misses as the Fed pauses, skips a meeting. I believe they should do that. Uh, they hadn't really planned on having that many moves this year. Anyhow, you'd mm -hmm. think they will be more patient. That should be a, a, a tremendous market. Robert, I want you to speak to the people on radio and television trying to get into April, trying to get to summer. And the rationalization is I can buy a new higher coupon and I can wait even if price goes down and yield goes up. Is that a PGM core idea that the coupon now is good enough where I can take a bigger participation in fixed income? It, it's not a belief. It, it's not a mystery. It is a fact. Uh, when we were in an environment, you know, 2012 to 2020 with an average 2% or less 10-year treasury, you know, your, your goalposts for kicking a field goal in fixed income are about that wide. And over that 10-year period, you could do it. You had a positively sloped curve. You had a lot of alpha opportunities. But now we've adjusted. And things have really changed. I mean, the goalposts were pretty wide for equities in a low real deal, yield environment. And that's flipped. Now the goalposts for equities are pretty tight. Growth is slow. Real yields are higher. Bond yields are attractive. As you're pointing out, when you have a big fat coupon, if you're in it for the long run, if you're going into high yield or you're going into diversified fixed income or even the first handful of years of, of the corporate bond market, your odds of success are pretty good. When I look at the total return index, it's had a really nice recovery. We talk about, you know, chart formations in the equity market. 
in the bond market, are you seeing a chart formation that says price up, yield down? Well, I think what we're going to see is yield range bound returns high. Uh, and we've just seen the second quarter of that. So uh, I'm perfectly willing to dive into the payroll numbers and, and want to you know, split hairs. But you have to see you know, progression of months. You can't jump on, on a single data point. Um, but basically, the long end of the yield curve has been very stable, <clears throat> especially so on long spread product, where there's been an inverse correlation between spreads and yields. So in other words, Treasury yields go down, spreads widen. The long term general fixed income yield is, is banging around <clears throat> much less. And yield fluctuations are really steep at the front end of the curve. We've seen a 200 basis point range say, in your expectations of where the Fed funds rate is going to be, you know, six to 12 months from now. But at the back end of the curve for the long bond, it's been fairly range bound. So this this bull market that we've started six months ago is going to be one where rates remain kind of high and range bound and people earn their money by clipping the total return and looking for alpha opportunities within the market. Robert, where does that leave the credit call now for you and the team? What have you and the team been doing over the last month as this banking sure. stress started to come to the surface? Yeah, well, I think that, um, you know, uh, you know, could there be an economic sudden stop? Could there be troubles for, for credit? Could you finally have the recession? You could. Um, but looking from the bottom up, there are way too many credits uh, where the outlook is fairly stable and the spreads look attractive relative to the underlying risks. So I think on a 12 to 24 month basis, you're going to end up seeing strong returns, whether it's from high yield, hard currency emerging markets, or from your intermediate uh, uh, investment grade corporates or structured products. But it's going to be a noisy six months as we wait to see exactly how much slowdown do you get. But slowdowns can be very good for spread product. Robert Tipp of PGM. Thank you. Robert Tipp there with a more constructive view, Tom. Push, pushing out the timeline just a bit I, longer and taking yeah. a more constructive view of things right now. This constructive view, and this goes to, you know, in another world, it goes to Neil Dutt at Renaissance Macro and other, I'm going to say, optimists that are, that are out there. It's just so easy to be gloomy now. And given the uncertainty, and I mean almost a theoretical uncertainty, boy, gloom comes easy. And, you know, I'm making jokes. I'm talking about the whisper number. Sure. But John and I know, and McKee lives this, this is serious stuff. And people were really skewed gloom. And once again, this confounds the chairman of the Federal Federal Reserve. And th there you go with another radar. People are going, why? We're all going to die with another radar. Well, you've got to well, ask, says who? You've got to ask, why is it so easy to be gloomy right now? It's so easy to be gloomy right now because unemployment's at 3.5%. And there's a belief that there's only one way it can go from these kind of levels, Tom. And that's higher after 12 months of tightening and put the banking stress on top of that. I, I want to squeeze this in, uh, uh, John, with Anastasia coming up. The levels of the equity market now, and, and our guests today have alluded to that, 4141 SPX, 337 rounded up, 34,000 on the Dow. And to me, the NASDAQ is an act of God. It is 13,184. There's no way, John, when you penciled out your March 31 outlook on, in December 31, <laughs> that you and I were looking for that. How's that tour going oh, with your I mean, outlook? For goodness sake, how's, how's the annual outlook going from <clears throat> December, November, October time? I think we've had three different narratives, Tom, in three different months. Oh, we have. And it's, Soft it's, landing, no landing, hard landing, just like that. And it's One the, quarter. the new volatility that's, that's out there. You start praying we're going to have less volatility in April, less volatility in May. It's going to be quote-unquote normal. I see no indication of that. I need proof that I, that I will see Can that. Can we just reconfirm? No opening bell in four minutes. The market's closed. No, we're going to have an okay, opening bell for Gina there's, Raimondo. There's some, some muscle memory there that may be. You ever been to Rhode Island? Yes, of course. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's lovely. Gina New, Raimondo. New, Newport? Governor Romendo is Newport. Yeah. Yes, they have bars. Mm, many. <laughs> <laughs>
sometimes for the wrong reason. 230k <laughs> was the median estimate. 236 number <clears throat> is the number we got. Let's look at the market action off the back of it. Some market action out there. It's in the bond market, actually. If you look at treasuries, twos, tens and thirties, the two-year yield, Tom, off the back of this, just higher by 11 basis points. And I think some people might be asking why it was in line with expectations. It was in line with the survey. When we say expectations, I think we need to be a little bit more <clears throat> purposeful and precise. What the market was looking for was something weaker off the back of yes. a string of weaker than expected data so far this week. And so this move speaks to that. We recalibrate for Monday, and then we'll go to Washington for the IMF meetings Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I believe we're there Friday as well. How do we recalibrate off the weekend notes this dreaded R-word recession? I mean, I have no idea how you rewrite about it after this jobs report. Longer available lags of a bank in shock. Keep going back to that phrase, Tom. We've only just gone through it. Yeah. It's only about a month Cumul old. Cumulative. But not even. Then cumulative. you've got the cumulative tightening of the last 12 months on top of that, Tom. So you've got 0 to 5% on Fed funds. We'll go through 5. That's what people expect to happen in early May. 0 through 5 in just a little bit more than a year. Mm -hmm. Throw on top of that some banking stress, which many people believe will lead to tighter lending standards. And there's a belief that, yes, this data is good this morning, oh. but ultimately it will get weak. And now the problem you'll have with that, Tom, and many others will as well, is we've been saying that now for the best part of 12 months. But we didn't have a banking overlay, and the fact is the four big banks chart on radio, I've got my finger out level, and every other bank, KBW, X, whatever, is, is trending down. As Mohammed said, those earnings reports are critical. We look forward to I'm um, with week. you. Yeah, First Republic on Thursday, <clears throat> so the 13th, and right. J.P. Morgan... On the Friday, Tom, it's too soon to really know what that banking stress is going to do to credit conditions. Yeah, we're going to get more of Directionally, that I think you can make a call. Directionally, but I think magnitude, just way too soon to make that call. To what extent things will get worse. We'll have to see. future. I love that. I'm quoting futures here. The market. Oh, the market's open. Excuse me. I shouldn't be quoting futures here. There is no market open. You know There's that. There's no market. <laughs> you know that. Just, you know that. Here we are. Have another sink of time. Okay. Right now, saving us, Anastasia Amorosa, Chief Investment Strategist at iCapital. And what's magnificent about her notes is there's always a phrase where I just stop and say, how'd you get out front of that? Anastasia, you absolutely nailed it. Pre-trading the recession. That's what we're all doing right now. We're pre-trading we're pre the recession. That's right, Tom. I mean, that's what this whole week has been about. I mean, we started the week, you know, maybe soft landing. Then we had this question in the middle of the week is bad, really bad. And then some of the headlines, you know, as of yesterday, were here we are headed for a hard landing in a recession. And I think it's doing exactly that. It's pre-trading and saying that it's imminent. And I think what the payrolls report today really confirms, it's a positive surprise we needed. The recession is not imminent. And as long as the unemployment rate is at three and a half percent and consumers are getting 4.2 percent more year over year in their wages, there is no imminent recession. Consumption is going to go on. And I think, Tom, you're right. You said this earlier that there's so much gloom out there. And whether you look at market consensus, whether you look <clears> at the move, you know, what's priced in the front of the curve, whether right. you look at what the economists are calling for, they're calling for zero percent consumption. But my point is this economy is slowing, it's cooling, but it's not cratering. And so, therefore, I would not just yet pre trade a recession. I mean, the Wall Street Journal, I believe, is on the left column uh, here, talks about the gloom in equities, the lack of participation in equities. How does the stock market lift the way it is? SPX up 7%, NASDAQ up, I, I don't know, 10, 15, whatever number uh, percent it is. How does the market lift if everybody's so cautious on equities? Well, I think people may have to go into chasing mode, Tom. I think that's what sort of you know propelled the rally so far year today because everybody came into the year so gloomy. And when I look at the positioning today, it is still quite gloomy. You look at uh, the systematic trade and the net long exposures for the S&P are really a rock bottom levels. The same for tech. If you look at mutual funds that have been underweight technology, for example, and so all the cohorts of investors are greatly underweight. But that means if we manage, you mentioned some of the levels before, Tom, if we manage to hang around these current levels and maybe move a little bit higher, a lot of people are going to find themselves having to buy, being forced to buy. And so the question then becomes, what is the fundamental reason for people to buy? And I think it's going to be the first quarter earnings season, because once again, 
People came into the year expecting 0% GDP growth. Instead, it looks like we're getting 1.7% in the first quarter or so. And earnings estimates have already been drastically marked down. So I think the earnings season might actually be the positive surprise uh, that people are not expecting. So number one question then, Anastasia, we've had this range of 3,800 to 4,200 for the best part of this year. You think we're breaking out of that to the upside, not to the downside? Near, near term, John, I do think that we might actually break above 4,200. And, you know, I, get, I say that because the economy is not cratering and it's actually surprising to the upside. I mean, also look at China. It's already seen a rebound in the first quarter, but in the second quarter, consensus is looking for 7.4% GDP growth. So we might be going into the next quarter with even stronger economic data. So, you know, you put all of that together, and I think that's the market that can continue to break out to the upside uh, near term. At some point, you know, the concerns about recession will have to surface. But it, for the meantime, the markets are looking for the Fed pause. If the Fed pauses historically, Tom and John, the markets have rallied quite strongly in the next three months, six months, and 12 months. And again, that's why, you know, if the tightening phase is over, which is kind of produces the worst returns outside of the recession, then the next phase after that can actually be pretty good for market returns. Can we just dig deeper into the leadership question, Anastasia, where you'd expect leadership to come from within the equity market? I am sticking with the NASDAQ uh, trade, John. And, you know, the reason for that is if you think about what was the sector that was hit the most as the Fed hike rates from zero to 500 basis points, of course, it was the technology sector. It was the reset and valuations that had to happen. But if that reset has been done and we're not going to have the same headwind to multiples, that's a really meaningful thing for, for tech. But of course, you can't just invest in something just because multiples or now expect to stay stagnant, you invest in something because you expect growth to come out of that sector. And that's where I would continue to see growth as we see a slowdown in industrials, you know, maybe some slowdown in consumer. Guess what's not slowing down? The race towards artificial intelligence, the race towards adoption of more uh, cloud computing, the race, you know, uh, that requires a whole lot of semiconductors. And so that's why when you look at the growth prospects for the NASDAQ, for the tech sector versus the S&P, uh, the tech trade actually should outperform based on those earnings expectations. It certainly outperforms this year so far. Anastasia, this was great. Thank you. Anastasia Amoroso there of iCapital on the equity market. Year to date, the NASDAQ up by more than 15% <clears throat> after getting crushed last year. Some of these big tech names bouncing back in a big way. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program live on TV and radio from New York. Just a special program for you to bring you some of the jobs numbers a little bit earlier this morning 236,000 the median estimate was 230,000 off the back of let's call it an upside surprise on payrolls yields higher at the front end of the curve and right the way through the curve as well the two-year out to the 30-year on the two-year up 13 basis points your yield right now Tom 396 on a two-year this morning and quite a trip so far this week we've yes. gone from 4.1 percent had a look at well, the 360s, come back to 396. Tom, this year's been nuts. We mentioned it earlier it on this morning. Jim Bianco, Jim, thanks for watching the program. Thanks for listening of Bianco Research. Bianco's watching us now? I believe so, he's because he's so echoed dedicated. what I mentioned a little bit earlier yeah. this morning, Tom. January, soft landing. February, no landing. March, hard landing. What's April going to bring us? It's only well, just started. This is the zeitgeist, and Bianco, frankly, has led here. There's there's two levels here. I'm not going to go into it right now, but on economics, it's led by Adam Tooze, Adam Posen, Mohamed Alarian, and others on what are we going to do with inflation, sustained, and nominal GDP. The rest of it is over to Bianco and markets, and he has led here, John, on what Lisa's talked about, which is this new 5%. And that's really where we are is a center tendency on CDs, money markets, up by five. And then this – I mean, John, with the, with the market open now, the Dow's at 33,723. <laughs> are we going to get a 4% yield before you and I go out and find our Can Easter I baskets? just jump in? Tom's joking. The market's not trading today. There was no opening. It's not? There was why, no wait, market open. Why, you why know this. Here? You know, <laughs> that's a different question. That's a different question entirely. It's not open? No. You, equity futures were earlier, and the Treasury market is. I put in a buy order in Hershey's. Cash Treasuries. What you buying? Uh, chocolate. Yeah. What are you buying? What's what you doing Easter? East, you put Easter a buy eggs. order in Hershey's, and you know, I mean, I mean, the American tradition here of the kids. What's great with the kids, John, 
is they get the jelly beans when they're two or three in their mouth, and they look like, like chipmunks a hamster, like, like, like this. Like a hamster. Yeah, like a hamster, and then they go out like a gun across the living room carpet, and they ruin that, and then they're sick for the rest of the day. Okay. It's an Easter tradition. Is it like that in, in England? Yeah, you'd get a lot of you Easter eggs. You'd do a hunt, you do a and hunt and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah, okay. We'd hide them in the backyard. Very good. And you go look for them. Why are we doing this? Because it's the tradition. We're talking, okay, you great. Know, we're talking cool, about good. it's Good Friday. and you know. Well, happy Easter. Thanks for thanks Mark for being with us. <laughs> Welcome, Tom. Welcome, TK. <laughs> let's go through the data. Two thirty-six was the number this morning. But you just go back on the totality of the data. Fed's phrasing. Forgive me. Over the week so far, ADP was a miss. Jolts was much lower than expected. Oh, Jobless yeah. claims yesterday morning yeah. broke out. People were talking. ISM manufacturing services not great at all. And all of a sudden, it's okay. Nothing to see well, here. Payrolls look good. But then at 60,000 feet, the IMF taking global growth, which I believe includes the American economy, down 21 percent, a five-year view from 3.8 percent down to 3 percent, and clearly the rhetoric from Dr. Gorgieva was a lower number. John, that's the overlay of the global caution with the data we saw this week, and this jobs report says simply wait another 30 well, days. What happened to the global enthusiasm of 60 days ago? China's reopening, Europe's doing great, international equities is where you want to be. Do you remember that? That was the consensus, what, I, I, 60 days ago? Yes. Yeah. I, and, and frankly, I would say there's a, there's a school of thought that Europe is outpacing America right now, uh, particularly in terms of wages and health of the labor economy. I don't know where that's going to sit in May, but that's where we are right now. Very shortly, we'll be joined by the Commerce Secretary. Looking forward to that conversation. <clears throat> there is no equity market open this morning, at least. I can talk about the bond market, though. Your two-year higher by 13 basis points, the 396.39, off the back of a better-than-expected jobs report in America this morning. From New York, good morning. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Russia may quit the Ukraine grain deal if obstacles in the way of Russian grain and fertilizer exports aren't resolved within 60 days. That's according to Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, who spoke in Turkey today. Despite Lavrov's comment, Russia is forecast to be the world's largest wheat exporter in the 2022-23 season, and its export prices have become the de facto global benchmark. Taiwan officials say they still expect a visit from U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. McCarthy met Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen earlier this week in Los Angeles, stressing the importance of the relationship between the two sides to economic freedom, peace and stability in the region. The location was apparently chosen to avoid a repeat of the tension seen in August when Nancy Pelosi became the first sitting House Speaker in 25 years to visit Taiwan. Tesla is slashing the prices of all of its vehicles in the U.S. It's an effort to shore up weakening demand for its electric vehicles as CEO Elon Musk vows to chase volume over profit margins. Price tags have been trimmed to by $1,000 to $5,000. And Toyota says it will release 10 new EV models by 2026 and sell 1.5 million battery electric vehicles a year. It's part of the company's pledge to half emissions by 2035 and become carbon neutral by 2050. In his first press conference, Toyota's new CEO, Koji Sato, stopped short of giving concrete steps about how the company will match its EV rivals abroad. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. starting to see some signs of crack in the leading indicators as well as the more real-time data whether you look at ism this week or some of the uptake in terms of jobless claim and so those cracks could really start to turn into craters 
Nadia Lovell there of UBS. Wonderful to catch up with her. Fantastic lineup throughout the whole of this morning. Thanks for choosing Bloomberg Thanks TV people, yeah. and Bloomberg Radio for going on this adventure on a payrolls Friday, on a good Friday. Payrolls Friday churns out this number, Tom, in the United States, 236,000. We were looking for a number of something like 230K. Surveillance correction. Mike McKee corrected me. I did the math. Yes, we created over the last 90 days over 1 million jobs off non-farm payrolls. Average 345, 345,000. John, in any time pre-pandemic, that is a sterling 90 days. The last time we had a downside surprise on payrolls, Tom, March of last year, we got that report in early April. You know, a major Just shout out to the optimists that are, that, are, that are out there right now. We've got a really strong end here to our morning. We want you to stay with us on radio and television. We're going to get market economic analysis here and scheduled to be with the Secretary of Commerce here uh, in moments. Tiffany Wilding now with PIMCO. Thrilled that she could join us this morning. Tiffany, what was the distinctive feature for you of this jobs report? Well, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, obviously the, the payroll number on the surface was very strong. And as you mentioned, the three month moving average is, is well above, um, you know, kind of what we need to sustain the level of the unemployment rate. Um, but, but if you look at the wage numbers, I actually thought that was kind of interesting because on a three month over three month basis, average hourly earnings is decelerating. Um, we were at six and now we're at three. That's much closer to the Fed's uh, targets. So, you know, I'd say actually overall, you know, this payroll report, even though we're talking about recession and, and things like that, you know, at least this payroll report um, was very consistent with the with the soft landing view that the Fed has. Matt, the, the soft landing view that they have means, I guess, there's no fear of a 25 beep lift. If they lift 25 more basis points, who is damaged? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, from an economist perspective, 25 basis points isn't really a lot, okay. right? Um, it's, it's really all about, you know, the five percentage points that have increased, uh, you know, over the course of, of the last year uh, that really matters. You know, and ultimately, the you know, we've talked about a lot about long and variable lags. You know, that, in our view, is impacting the economy. And I think that the banking stress that you're seeing or that we have seen is kind of symptomatic of those long and variable lags and the fact that monetary policy conditions are tight. Um, you know, so I, I, you know, I do, I will say that as everyone knows, the labor market does tend to lag. Um, you do see growth decelerating first, you know, and we think that that, you know, is happening and will continue to happen. And then eventually labor markets uh, will also uh, decelerate more as well. Uh, Tiffany, is there a point on the calendar where you'd be comfortable saying that's about the time I think we should realize, recognize just how much credit tightening we'd expect of the bank of the banking stress of the last month? When are we going to find that out? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, we are starting to see it, some of the higher frequency data, um, you know, that lending growth is slowing in some of the regionals. Obviously, the deposits are moving out of uh, some of the midsize and smaller banks. And, you know, I think overall, the cost of capital for those midsize and smaller banks, as for everyone else, is going up. And so that's just going to make loans, um, you know, less attractive for them to make. But overall, I just take a step back. Um, we've done an analysis just looking over 14 developed markets over the past 70 years um, around tightening cycles. And what that suggests is that after a central bank starts hiking interest rates around four to eight quarters after, you tend to see a more material deceleration in the output gap and in growth. So that's kind of lining up with what we're seeing. Um, you know, it's maybe suggestive that in the second half, we actually could see some more deterioration. Tiffany, this was wonderful to get your view. Tiffany Wilding of PIMCO in on a holiday. We appreciate that. Tiffany, All of our guests. thank you very much. <laughs> 236,000, the jobs number, Tom, 230K, the estimate. And now a conversation, as we uh, do with someone who works 365 days of the year. She is the U.S. Commerce Secretary, but far more the former governor of Rhode Island. And what is so important within the stereotype of our politicians removed from the labor economy that is not Gina Raimondo. The Commerce Secretary joins us now with the experience of the collapse of the Bull of a Watch Company in Rhode Island. Oh, Gina, I lived it with you. You lived it in real time with your father. There's an awful lot of America feeling they're living the Bull of a Watch experience right now. How does the administration speak to those that are not prospering? Uh, good morning. Good to see you. Well, first of all, the administration is speaking directly to those people because the president is obsessed with bringing more manufacturing back to America. In fact, I was with the president last week in Hickory, North Carolina, a town just like what we're talking about. 
and I was there because of expansions of two American companies making fiber optic cable uh, because of our initiatives to provide every American broadband. So, you know, the president's calling on manufacturers to make more in America. It is working and it's reflected in these jobs numbers. I mean, this is an excellent jobs report. Mm -hmm. You're seeing record low black unemployment. You're seeing record low unemployment among people who have been left behind. And the best news for me is higher percentage of people working in the workforce um, anytime in decades. So we're going to middle America. We're going to folks like my dad who were left behind in the collapse of manufacturing and we're getting them back to work. That's the message to Middle America. Secretary Raimondo, what's the message to the Europeans as you do this? Uh, work with us. You know, I'm headed to Europe at the end of next month. Uh, we need to work together. And, you know, I think whether it's the IRA or the CHIPS uh, initiative, there's opportunities for European companies and opportunities for us to work together to meet the moment with climate change and our global competition with China. Perhaps I should have been more precise. European companies will invest in the United <clears throat> States. What's the message for European governments who are perhaps unhappy about what's happening at the moment? It's the same message. You know, I, I understand that there was some initial concern about the IRA in particular. But I'll tell you, we are in constant contact with our European colleagues, in including me. I've met with numbers of them and from Germany, from the EU in the past couple of months. I think they're now understanding that there are opportunities for them. And by the way, we all need to do more to combat climate change. So uh, initial hurt feelings maybe, but, but there's a lot of good work to do together. Let's talk about what's happening with supply chains. I know this is very important to you. Adam Poston of the Peace and Institute said the idea that making everything domestically build resiliency is, quote, the fallacy of self-sufficiency and has been disproven repeatedly. How would you respond to that? He's right. I mean, nobody thinks we should be making everything that we need in America. Nobody's saying we should be self-sufficient. It's a global economy. We want to continue to trade. Uh, but in the case of semiconductors, for example, which are essential to our national security, the fact that we buy 90 plus percent of our leading edge chips from Taiwan is also unsustainable and, quite frankly, almost dangerous. So I'm, mm. no one would say we need to make enough chips in America for all that we consume. That that would be silly. But we do need to have more resiliency. Madam Secretary, I spoke to the managing director of the IMF yesterday, and it could have easily been a 110 percent conversation on China. You are gifted in that you have Elizabeth Economy advising you, arguably our best young China expert in America. What is Dr. Economy advising you on about improved China-U.S. relationships? Well, I am smiling because Dr. Economy is about to get on a plane and head to China. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, uh, what we are doing is pursuing the policy of protecting and promoting. Uh, first and foremost, we have to protect the United States of America and our national security. And we're doing that with gusto, with our export controls and guarding our tech leading edge technology. Having said that, where it makes sense, we need to promote, we need to export, we need to help American businesses and make sure that China provides for a level playing field. So that's the administration's strategy. You are correct that I am extremely lucky to have Liz. She's extraordinary and she's here in the Commerce Department. There is no level playing field. There is a lack of recipro reciprocity when it comes to things like social media and tech. Secretary Raimondo, do you think then that we need to start banning more things here in the United States? There is a law called the Restrict Act weaving its way through Congress. The chief architect is Senator Mark Warner of Virginia, which I think is, a, is excellent and is very sensible, which is to say, I do not think we should get into a witch hunt sort of yeah. environment where we go after individual companies by name one at a time. I do think, which is what this law provides, is more tools to the Commerce Department for constant you know, surveillance, ability to uh, investigate and then perhaps regulate right. companies.
Well, this is a conversation that we're going to continue to have. Madam Secretary, this was fantastic. Thank you. This is Bloomberg.